for two of those. All right, everyone, we are live for our Torah study today. We're all strolling in to get us started here. Nothing happens in the spiritual realm that's not good. You ever see the butterfly effect? Yes. I love that. <laughs> All right. So we are live at the Vine, and um, I'm going to open us up in prayer, and then we'll Amen. start reading this week's portion. Father, thank you for gathering us together today. Uh, thank you for calling us out of the darkness into your marvelous, marvelous light, the light of your word, the truth of it from the very first letter to the very last, from the Aleph to the Tav. We're so grateful for um, this time that we can come together, read your word, discuss it, Midrash, and um, learn something new. For some of us, it's been many years that we've gone through these portions. Uh, for others of us, fewer, but each time uh, you bring something out that we haven't seen before. That's our prayer anyway, Father, that we would um, hear you speak to us through your word. So thank you for this time. Thank you for the fellowship and uh, for your spirit. In Yeshua's name, amen. <coughs> Okay, you can um, you can have that one. Mm hmm. <laughs> okay, so this week's portion from the Torah is uh, Exodus twenty-seven, starting in verse ten. Uh, twenty, Exodus twenty-seven, verse twenty through chapter 30, verse 10. And our esteemed reader is getting ready to read this to us. Let's read it. Just read it all. 30, 10. Mm -hmm. All right, Exodus 27, verse 20. And you, you are to command the children of Israel to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light, to cause the lamp to burn continually. In the tent of appointment outside of the veil, which is before the witness, Aaron and his sons are to tend it from evening until morning before Yehovah, a law forever to their generations from the children of Israel. And you, bring near Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, for serving as priests to me, Aaron, Nabab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, the sons of Aaron. And you shall make set-apart garments for Aaron, your brother, for esteem and for comeliness. And you, speak to all the wise of heart, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, and they shall make the garments of Aaron to set him apart for him to serve as priest to me. And these are the garments which they make, a breastplate 
a shoulder garment, a robe, an embroidered long shirt, a turban, and a girdle. And they shall make set apart garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, for him to serve as a priest to me. And they shall take the gold and the blue and the purple and the scarlet material and the fine linen, and shall make the shoulder garment of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet material, and fine woven linen, the work of a skilled workman. It is to have two shoulder pieces joined at its two edges, and so it is joined together. And the embroidered band of the shoulder garment, which is on it, is of, of the same workmanship, made of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet material, and fine woven linen. And you shall take two shoham stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone, and the remaining six names on the other stone, according to their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. Set them in settings of gold. And you shall put the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the shoulder garment as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before Yehovah on his two shoulders for, uh, for a remembrance. And you shall make settings of gold and two chains of clean gold like braided cords and fasten the braided chains to the settings. And you shall make a breastplate of right ruling, a work of skilled workmen and like the work of the shoulder garment. Make it of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine woven linen. It is square, doubled in a span, a span its length and a span its width. And you shall put settings of stones in four rows of stones. The first row is a ruby, a topaz, and an emerald. And the second row is a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row is jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row is a beryl, and a shoham, and a jasper. They are set in gold settings. And the stones are according to the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, each one with its own name for the twelve tribes. And you shall make braided chains of corded work for the breastplate at the end of clean gold. And you shall make two rings of gold for the breastplate, and shall put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And you shall put the two cords of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate, and the other two ends of the two cords you fasten to the two settings, and put them on the shoulder pieces of the shoulder garment in the front. And you shall make two rings of gold, and shall put them on the two ends of the breastplate, on the edge of it, which is on the inner side of the shoulder garment. And you shall make two rings of gold, and put them on the two shoulder pieces underneath the shoulder garment, on the front of it. Close it to the seam above the embroidered band of the shoulder garment, and they bind the breastplate by means of its rings to the rings of the shoulder garment, using a blue cord so that it is above the embroidered band of the shoulder garment, so that the breastplate does not come loose from the shoulder garment. And Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of right ruling over his heart when he goes into the set-apart place for remembrance before Yehovah continually." And into the breastplate of right ruling you shall put the Urim and the Thummim, and shall be on the heart of Aaron when he goes in before Yehovah. And Aaron shall bear the right ruling of the children of Israel on his heart before Yehovah continually. And you shall make the robe of the shoulder garment all of blue. And the opening for his head shall be in the middle of it, a woven binding all around its opening, like the opening in a scaled armor, so that it does not tear. And on its hem you shall, make a pom you shall make pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet material all around its hem, and bells of gold between them all around. A golden... Oh, hold on. Rewind. Okay. 33. And on its hem you shall make a pomegranate of blue and purple and scarlet material all around its hem, and bells of gold between them all around. A golden bell and a pomegranate. A golden bell and a pomegranate on the hem of the robe all around shall be upon Aaron to attend in, and its sound shall hear when he goes into the set-apart place before Yehovah, and when he comes out, so that he does not die. And you shall make a plate of clean gold and engrave on it, like the engraving of a signet, set apartness to Yehovah. And you shall put it on a blue cord, and it shall be on the turban. It is to be on the front of the turban, 
and it shall be on the forehead of Aaron, and Aaron shall bear the guilt of the set-apart gifts with which the children of Israel set apart and all their set-apart gifts, and it shall always be on his forehead for acceptance for them before Yehovah. And you shall weave the long shirt of fine linen and shall make the turban of fine linen, and you shall make the girdle of woven work and make long shirts for Aaron's sons, and you shall make girdles for them, and you shall make turbans for them for esteem and comeliness. And you shall put them on Aaron your brother and on his sons with him, and shall anoint them, and shall ordain them, and shall set them apart, and they shall serve as priests to me, and make linen trousers for them to cover their nakedness, reaching from the waist to the thighs, and they shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they come to the tent of appointment, or when they come near the slaughter place to attend in the set-apart place, so that they do not bear crookedness and die. A law forever to him and to his seed after him. 29. And this is the task you shall do to them to set them apart to serve me as priests. Take one young bull and two rams, perfect ones, and unleavened bread and unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers anointed with oil. Make these of wheat flour. And you shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket along with the bull and the two rams. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tent of appointment and wash them with water. And you shall take garments and shall put on Aaron the long shirt and the robe of the shoulder garment and the shoulder garment and the breastplate and the sh shall gird him with the embroidered band of the shoulder garment and shall put the turban on his head, and shall put the set-apart sign of dedication on the turban, and shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put long shirts on them, and shall gird them with girdles, Aaron and his sons, and put the turbans on them. And the priesthood shall be theirs for an everlasting law. So you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. And you shall bring near the bull before the tent of appointment, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. And you shall slay the bull before Yehovah by the door of the tent of appointment, and f take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the, horns of the slaughter place with your finger, and pour all the blood beside the base of the slaughter place. And you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails and the appendage on the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them and burn them in the slaughter place. But the flesh of the bull and its skin and its dung you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. And take one ram and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram and you shall slay the ram and you shall take its blood and sprinkle it all around the slaughter place. And cut the ram into pieces, and wash its entrails and its legs, and place them upon its pieces on its head. And you shall burn the entire ram on the slaughter place. It is a sending offering to Yehovah. It is a sweet fragrance, an offering made by fire to Yehovah. And you shall take the second ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. And you shall slay the ram, and take some of its blood, and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron, and on the tip of the right ear of his sons, and on the thumb of their right hand, and on the big toe of their right foot, and sprinkle the blood all around the slaughter place. And you shall take some of the blood that is on the slaughter place, and some of the anointing oil, and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments, on his son sons and on the garments of his sons with him and he and his garments shall be set apart and his sons and the garments of his sons with him and you shall take the fat of the ram and the fat tail and the fat that covers the entrails and the appendage on the liver and the two kidneys and the fat on them and the right thigh it is for a ram of ordination and one loaf of bread and one cake made with oil, and one thin cake from the basket of the unleavened bread that is before Yehovah. And you shall put all these in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons, and you shall wave them, a wave offering, before Yehovah. Then you shall take them from their hands and burn them on the slaughter place as an ascending offering, as a sweet fragrance before Yehovah. It is an offering made by fire to Yehovah. And you shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's ordination and wave it, a wave offering before Yehovah, and it shall be your portion. And from the ram of ordination you shall set apart the breast of the wave offering which is waved, and the thigh of the contribution which is raised, of that which is for Aaron, of that and of that that is 
and of that which is for his sons. And it shall be from the children of Israel for Aaron and his sons by a law forever for its contribute contribution. Oh boy. <laughs> 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 Thank you. And it is a contribution from the children of Israel, from the slaughters of their peace offerings and their contribution to Yehovah. And the set-apart garments of Aaron are for his sons after him to be anointed in them and to be ordained in them. The priest from his sons in his place puts them on for seven days when he enters a tent of appointment to attend in the set-apart place and take the ram of ordination and cook its flesh in a set-apart place. And Aaron and his son shall eat the flesh of the lamb, the ram, and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tent of appointment. And they shall eat those offerings with which the atonement was made to ordain them to set them apart. But let a stranger not eat them because they are set apart. And in any of the flesh of the ordination offerings or of the bread be left over until morning, then you shall burn up what is left over. It is not clean because it is set apart. And so you shall do to Aaron and his sons according to all I have commanded you. Seven days you shall ordain them and prepare a bull each day as a sin offering for atonement. And you shall cleanse the slaughter place when you make atonement for it. And you shall anoint it to set it apart. For seven days you shall make atonement for the slaughter place and set it apart. And the slaughter place shall be most set apart. Whatever touches the slaughter place is to be set apart. And this is what you prepare on the slaughter place, two lambs, a year old, daily, continually. Prepare the one lamb in the morning and the other lamb you prepare between the evenings. And one-tenth of the ephah of flour mixed with one-fourth of a hen of pressed oil and a fourth of a hen of wine as a drink offering with one lamb. And prepare the other lamb between the evenings. And with it, prepare the grain offering and the drink offering as in the morning for a sweet fragrance an offering made by fire to Yehovah, a continual ascending offering for your generations at the door of the tent of appointment before Yehovah, where I shall meet with you to speak with you. And there I shall meet with the children of Israel, and it shall be set apart by my esteem. And I shall set apart the tent of appointment and the slaughter place. And Aaron and his son I set apart to serve as priests to me. And I shall dwell in the midst of the children of Israel, and shall be their Elohim. And they shall know that I am Yehovah, their Elohim, who brought them up out of the land of Mitzrayim to dwell in their midst. I am Yehovah, their Elohim. Chapter 30. And you shall make a slaughter place to burn incense on. Make it of acacia wood, a cubit long and a cubit wide. It is a square and two cubits high, its horns of the same. And you shall overlay its top and its sides all around, and its horns with clean gold, and you shall make for it a molding of gold all around, and make two gold rings for it, under the molding on both sides, on both of its sides, make them on its two sides, and they shall be holders for the poles to lift it with. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold, and you shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the witness, before the lid of atonement that is over the witness, where I am to meet with you. And Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense, morning by morning, as he tends the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps between the evenings, he shall burn incense on it, a continual incense before Yehovah throughout your generations. Do not offer strange incense on it, or an ascending offering, or a grain offering, and do not pour a drink offering on it. And Aaron shall make atonement upon its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once a year he makes atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most set apart to Yehovah. Amen. Come on, bring it. Take questions. Questions, statements, comments. All right, so this has to do with the Holy of Holies, and I guess going through this portion this time, it dawned on me through uh, listening to teachings and 
other people pointing it out that regular people didn't see the inside of the temple. They didn't see all the stuff that was going on. Like, unless I was a priest, I'm never going to get to go inside there and see all this stuff and what it looks like and get that, that closeness to Yah. Um, and so with all the requirements and uh, special stuff that God requires for the, you know, how it's got to be made this way, it's got to be this dimensions, yada, yada, yada. Um, it reminds me of that song ta- uh, that, you know, we sing sometimes, um, like, I want to enter into the Holy of Holies. I'm just wondering, is that just like a, a false mindset? Is that a false way of thinking about things? Can we even, can we even get in? Can we even, like, through our spirit and through praying, can we even get into, like, the Holy of Holies with him? Or is that sort of like, we need to come to Yeshua, we need to have take everything to Yeshua, and then Yeshua as the high priest, Yeshua goes to the Holy of Holies for the Father on our behalf. And we don't we don't actually go into the Holy of Holies. Um, that's where my thought process was going with this. Lori has a very good explanation of... Um, how all of that works, entering into the Holy of Holies, how you get so far into the tabernacle according to, oh, never mind. She said that last week. She said it last week, but she can say it again, right, Lori? I'm not going to say it again. You can, rewind. you can go back and rewind last week. Um, no, you heard it, Ryan, because we talked about it. But I will say this, that... In um, Revelation 21, it says, New Jerusalem, there is no temple, and the temple consists of the holy place and the holy of holies. And it says we have no, we have no, is this saying no temple? Uh, Because Yeshua is our altar now. So we do, we don't pray to Jesus, we pray through Jesus. You know, I mean, we've learned in the past, I think that's where we got stuck sometimes by praying to him, not through him, but he is the blood. He goes for us. So we will, you know, in, in the new city, in God's city, we will be with him because there will be no temple. Does that make sense? Yeah, what about right now? Right now we have him because we have, I got a bunch to say about that, but we're not quite there yet. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but we do have, he's operating in us or we're operating, I don't know how you would say it, he is in us right now. So we'll get there. Hold on. <laughs> and then kind of think about it, too, is presently on earth, there isn't a holy of holies like a tabernacle or temple. So, no, you can't go in there. <laughs> right. And remember, all of these things that we've talked about here over the last couple of weeks and will continue to talk about with respect to the tabernacle and then in a future temple, remember what the Father said to Moses when he was describing <coughs> those things and saying, make them in the way that you were shown, according to the pattern that you were shown. Well, where was he shown this pattern? But in heaven. These are earthly representations of the true tabernacle in in heaven. I agree with that. I think that you have every authority to worship in the holy in the heavenly temple to this day. I don't think that it's been torn down. Anybody want to challenge that? Is the heavenly temple still there? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's still I'm still pretty sure it's still standing. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't get torn down. <clears throat> but I guess I guess my my understanding the way I look at this is do you want to have that responsibility of going into the holy of holies? Do you think that you have that kind of 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 purity where you could go into the holy of holies? I mean, did you go before the pharaoh and did you say let my people go? Did you walk out of his out of Egypt? Did you go through the Red Sea? Did you do, you know, did you <clears throat> abstain from women for three days? You know, I mean, did you do all these things to make yourself holy unto Yahovah? Did you put on the breastplate? Did you 
give all of your worldly possessions so that they could be turned into the tabernacle? You know, were you willing to do what? What have you done to uh, gain entrance into the Holy of Holies? I guess that's a, a question you've got to ask yourself. Have I done enough or can I do more? Is there more that I should do? Is there more I can do? And I mean, that's the question for you to an answer for yourself. Well, I would say, with respect to that question, I would say, is any man or woman pure enough to qualify to go in there on their own standing? Okay. So, to summarize this, <laughs> Into real simple terms, for me, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's all about Jesus, because of Jesus, you know, and he's our advocate, and he, that shed blood of Jesus is our, is our conduit straight to the Father. I mean, the veil was rented, torn, you know. So, help me. How am I doing? You're doing good because that, that was that was on my heart. I was going to okay, share a little bit. Because I'm just keep, saying, if the, the way things are said and worded and this, that, and the other, you know, I just, you know, I've already locked into this a long time ago, so to speak. You know, and it's all because of Jesus. Because, first of all, as far as our sin goes, he doesn't see us. He sees Jesus. He's looking at us through the blood. You know, right, and so it's all about the blood that has paved the way again, conduit to or whatever. So we're able uh, for our prayers to go straight into the throne room right before him, uh, figuratively speaking. But yeah, he fixing throw a pitch. I already threw a hanging curveball at you, so you're it is, yeah. I got, I got something to follow that up with, you also. know. I mean, he's already it's all been done. That's how we are able to go straight into figuratively speaking. You know, we don't have to wait on our uh, make an appointment, you know, we're on the books all the time, you know. Help me out here. I'm doing still doing, doing good. good. Okay, I'm done for right now. All right, I want to share this with us also. When you talked about going into the temple, there was a there was a reason why they had to have what they had. And now that we're under the order of Melchizedek, because you can go back. Was that in? Uh, help me remember. That. Is that Romans or uh, Hebrews? Right, chapter seven, eleven. Okay, so I was I was all over it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um. So it's very clear that we're under a new order of priesthood, or it's not really a new order, it's just that that's the order we're under is the Melchizedek, and it goes through there and explains why, because even the priest, before they can do the atonement for the sins of Israel, had to atone for the sins themselves. So it wasn't the perfect way to do it, but with Yeshua, it is a perfect way to do it. Going back into what um, uh, Dean was saying, you know, when, when Yeshua died and, and the veil of the temple was torn in two, no longer did man have to go through man to, 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 to go to God, so to speak. And so now through, like he said, through Yeshua, Jesus, we now have that direct contact with the Father. And he stands before the adversary who's always accusing the brother. But he's like, he's like, he's like our lawyer, so to speak, where he's up there. He's our defense lawyer. Or he's like, nope, nope, it's already taken care of, already taken care of, already taken care of, already taken care of. No matter how much the enemy wants to speak against us, it's already been taken care of. And so when he talks about Yeshua being a conduit, it goes back to Jude, which we read every Shabbat, as it says, now to the one who can keep you from falling and set you, because we all have defects, but through the blood of Christ we don't, we're in the presence of our Father in the spiritual sense. It says, set you without defect and full of joy in the presence of God's glory, of his glory. And it says, and God is our deliverer, but it's through Yeshua, his son, the Messiah, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now, and forever. So I don't know if I'm kind of roundabout answering your question, but the necessity to even see the Holy Holies or go into it was no longer, that was no longer the case anymore because Christ paid the full price for this, for the atonement of sin. So anyway, that's my two shekels and a half. 
So That's you five ref- shekels, okay. <laughs> you refer to the altar, and I think I understand where you're coming from, where they they brought the um, the sacrifice was brought, and the, <coughs> the blood was shed, and then the animal was burnt on the altar, and it. So I think your your question um, is, um, we bring our sacrifice to the altar, and Yesh- Yeshua. Would that would he represent the altar because we bring our sacrifice to his feet? Is that yes? Okay. Yeah, it's in there somewhere. Okay. Um, so we know that when when Yeshua died, the veil was torn, and so that allowed us to enter into the holy of holies because it is by his shed blood that we become holy. Because it, that's it is by his shed blood that we become holy. And it is only by his blood that we become holy. Because before that, we had these, um, all of the, the laws of sacrifices that were instituted and um, offerings that we, that we brought, okay, meaning our ancestors brought um, before the priests and were, in, and were offered unto the Lord and the high priest was the one that was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. Well, now, like Joe was saying, under the Melchizedek order, Yeshua is our high priest, but because that veil has been torn, he is the segue they bring that allows us to go into the Holy of Holies because we now, it says in, in, um, in Scripture, that we are also priests. So, um, so we have that privilege, if you will, but it is only by the shed blood of Messiah. And when when I think of when I when I read this um when I read this portion and I read about all the sacrifices um that that were made by man's hand over and over and over again and how bloody that was and then I think of my Messiah and I think of how bloody he was and he is who makes us holy it's the sacrifice that it's no longer our sacrifice but it's his sacrifice that makes us holy Um, well, in considering this chapter, I think about um, right, to have a sense for what's sacred. I think it's so special when you come to um, sometimes a place that's been covered with prayer and where good energy radiates sort of uh, godly enthusiasm or that you can have a sense um, that it is a sacred space. And um, so it's it's um, interesting um, to look at the preparations that were made so that um, that reverence and awe could be in God's house. Um, and so Urim and Thummim, let me see. I trust the scholarship more that says um, that those represent light and perfection. And, of course, then people would consult um, using the ephod and the Urim and Thummim. And um, that, um, let me see, does anybody know what was an alternate definition of Thummim, right? Urim, that's the angelic language, like or is light, but in the angelic language, it's urim, the light. Right. And th- you know, does anybody know the alternate explanation? Okay, so light and perfection, anyway. <laughs> and, um, you know, um, to me, that sort of does. Interpretation. The other one is just interpretation. Yeah, so I, I, I tr- I've heard the other one, but I trusted this one more. But whatever, it just t- to me, it means about, like, reasoning in terms of light and perfection when seeking an insight or something. And, um, and then <clears throat> I think um, of how, Je- also considering this chapter, I think how Jesus said, sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. And um, in the chapter that was just quoted, it said, um, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a, n- a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us. This came to mind last week also. But um, the idea that, um, that the course that Jesus leads us on is um, takes us from what is carnal to what is spiritual. And um, anyway, I, I really appreciate, um, I had a few more thoughts on it, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and then after Lori, Kyle, you're up. All right, um, so back to the Revelation 21, where it says that in New Jerusalem there is no temple because there's no need for a temple anymore. Um, 
and what you were saying about the altar. Um, in Hebrews 13.10, we have an altar, which those who serve at the tent have no right to eat. And then in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, it says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, and the temple is you. So, I mean, I think that says everything right there. Yeshua tore down that veil. There is no need for a temple and a holy of holies anymore. God says in Revelation there will be none. It's in us already. So are you defiling the temple? What are you doing to the temple? Um, what are we bringing in through our eyes, our ears, our mouth? Um, I, I really sense this urgency of cleaning the temple now. Yeah. We have to cleanse this temple. Um, the Lord is about to do a work. Yeah. We are the temples. But, you know, when, when um, the, oh gosh, I forgot the guy's name, during Hanukkah, when they defiled the temple, the temple couldn't be used right then, could it? I mean, yes. Yes, Antiochus. The temple couldn't be used in that, that um, it had to be consecrated, yeah, in that condition. And that's where we are as a people right now. We've been in a time where we are t we've defiled the temple, and it is a time right now where that temple needs to be cleansed. We need to cleanse it because the Holy of Holies does reside in us, because what resided in the Holy of Holies? The Father, Right. So he, he resides in us. And um, I just, I don't know, I just have this overwhelming sense that this is the time more than any other time we have got to cleanse the temple. Yep. Oh, and one more thought. Um, Yeshua, anything that he touched became clean. He never was defiled because as he touched something, it was cleansed. We have that same blood running through us. We have the blood of Christ in us, which means that there are things we could do, but that doesn't mean we should do them. We, I truly believe if we touch something unclean, it becomes clean the moment we touch it. But if God said no, then the answer is still no. Like um, pork, for instance. If it accidentally goes into my mouth and I don't know that I ate it, I don't think it's going to make me unclean. I have the blood of Jesus in me, and that blood is cleansing it. Now, if I say, oh, the blood of Jesus cleaned this bacon, that is a sin. Then I've defiled the temple because then I, it's rebellion. It's not whatever. Yeah. But we need to remember that when we're doing spiritual warfare, when we're doing everything, it's the blood of Jesus in us, the blood of Yeshua that is going to work, not us, but the blood. That's it. Okay, Brother Kyle. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, good deal. Um, so a couple things. Um, going back to the, 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 the cleanse, uh, cleaning of the temple, that kind of stuff, cleaning of, of our temple, uh, absolutely. Um, it was mentioned in the... Uh, scriptures that we were just reading. Uh, it would, how about this? Is that better? Yeah, it is better. Okay. It was mentioned in the scriptures that we were just reading about not letting the strangers in there. And this was after it had already given us a description of how this was a place that was only for the priests, um, the priests and high priest, right? So referencing, I, 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 it's, it's a little redundant for this specific situation. But in reference to um, future tenses, like now, speaking in a spiritual sense, it's very applicable, uh, referencing letting strangers in. Um, the other thing is, I would, I would be, I would, I would caution people to, to, not be so quick to call ourselves the temple, but a temple. Uh, do a do us a, 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 a detailed study on that. And the reason why I say that is, yes, we are a temple, but calling ourselves the temple puts you in line with, with what we understand about end times prophetic things. Um, because if the, uh, if the bad guys are going to set up camp in, um, in the holy place, if you are the holy place, well, then you are no longer set apart and, can be received by the father. 
if if you have been defiled, if you have been made unclean by the you know antichrist and all this stuff. So there there's a big difference between a temple and the temple. Um, and yes, we are. It is it is a prophetic shadow picture of our temple and how we are to be uh, cleaned and sanctified and and all that stuff, all the the purification process, so that we can enter the gates, so that we can enter the court, so that we can um, submit with sacrifice, so that we can um, uh, look at the brazen look in the brazen laver and 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 seek out those things in us that need to be uh, removed and purified, and then enter into the holy place and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, before we are able to go before the, uh, the, the holy of holies. So, um, anyway, that's just my two shekels, I guess. But, um, but yes, the, 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 the purification or the sanctification or the, the sacrifice, all that stuff, this was something that was mentioned in redundancy. Uh, I don't know that it was, unless somebody can fill me in on this, unless I miss something, I don't think it's really relevant for the the stranger information unless this is referring to something that is a shadow picture of things to come referring to the spiritual aspect or spiritual side of the um, purpose of the temple or tabernacle, I should say. Thank you, Kyle. So I have a, uh, Ryan has a, uh, has a good question. Do we, how do we actually, can we go to the Holy of Holies? Uh, do we, you know, how do we go about that? Uh, is it necessary? Uh, Joel uh, actually brought some good uh, points. Uh, uh, the scripture that, uh, that I was reminded of is in, if you go with me to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, starting in verse, let's see, 17 says, and he came, uh, referring to Yeshua, and Yeshua came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, uh, through Messiah, we both have a, our access in one spirit to the Father. Right, so so that's uh, every everyone what the... Uh, uh, was talking about how do we actually have access that we don't go through the animals, but we go through uh, through Messiah to the Father. So that's uh, that's absolutely correct. Now the question is, uh, with the prayers, like as far as praying, you can pray uh, to uh, to our Father at any time, right? Uh, like Yeshua gave us the uh, the example. You know, they ask him, how do we pray? So he didn't yet, Yeshua didn't explain. Hey, you go through the uh, you know, through the holies, to the holy of holies, and then and then ask your prayer. Uh, you know, he said, you know, our Father in heaven, and then he gave us the example how to pray, right? So that's uh, that's as far as praying. Now, uh, so the question is, you know, why would we go all the way bef before the face of the Father? Through uh, through Yeshua, what what would that actually? What instance uh, is that? Is that do uh, is that a higher intercession? Uh, so that's a good question. And uh, me personally, my my two shekels on it, I would say that it is a, a higher intercession. And I'm in agreement with uh, Joel, where he was saying, you know, don't uh, you just don't run in there like. Like uh, what was the name of the two sons of uh, Aaron? Like uh, Abihu, uh, yeah, yeah, those two, uh, where they thought that they can actually go uh, uh, to approach God at the wrong time, at the uh, at the wrong manner, and then it has uh, had a consequences. And we actually had a really good conversation yesterday with uh, Kyle a little bit about that because I was I was sharing with him that I kind of. God is showing me, start uh, revealing to me. You know, I always wonder why didn't He show me everything about this tabernacle like seven when I was 26 years old, 17 years ago when I when I started approaching God. Why didn't He show me about all these ins and outs about the tabernacle? Well, uh, you know, the re uh, the reason uh, He didn't is because back then I was just kind of like, oh, you know, hey, there is I have Jesus and 
we're just best buddies and uh, and uh, and if i if somebody told me about the holy of holies uh i would be like okay you know i was in the mindset let me uh, explore let, let me i want to you know, whatever you tell me, I want to go and be there and, and see what it's about and all, all of that, right? So that would be like somebody would tell me about Tabernacle and Holy of Holies. I would be, okay, let me run in there and let me, you know, at that time I was still partying and, and drinking a little bit and maybe some little bit of some drugs and I would be like, here I am, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I think that would be another, uh, probably the flash coming from heaven, and and there would be a redeem no more. <laughs> so a strange fire. Uh, so yeah, I think that uh, if you want to go all the way like to the holy of holies in the spiritual realm, I think that that's what we're just reading this uh, this uh, parasha uh, Tetzaveh, uh, which is in English, and he commands. You have uh, instructions how to approach uh, God. Uh, you have a, uh, and you follow the same patterns that we've been shown in the spiritual realm. So at least, so that's at least what uh, I shared a little bit last week. Uh, that that's what I do uh, in the if I try to go to Holy of Holies before the f uh, Father's face, I go through the in the spiritual realm through, you know, the altar. Uh, acknowledge the blood of Messiah, then the washing uh, uh, your uh, hands at the li uh, liver. Um, then, okay, Shma, uh, yeah, and then uh, the showbread, uh, showbread. Then what's the next one? Uh, the the menorah. Uh, the next one, and then the uh, present uh, the the prayers. Uh, you know, and sometimes if you don't know wha how to pray, what to say, then pray in spirit, uh, right? And let them uh, go up. And then uh, if, if you, th as Joel s uh, said, if you've done all the homework and you've done what you're supposed to be doing, you're ready, you prepare, you're covered by the blood, you cleanse, you repent. And that the one thing that I haven't uh, uh, heard, it's not just the blood, it's blood and the repentance because... Yeshua actually explained that, right? He said, if you br bring the animal and you have the blood sacrifice, but there is something that you have against with your brother, then what he said, he said, leave the sacrifice and the blood, leave it there and go take care of that, and then uh, come and approach God, right? So n that hasn't changed, uh, right? So anyway, uh, that's enough said. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Okay, Ryan's waiting, and then uh, Rich or Sylvia has their hand up. They'll be next. I'm gonna let them go first. Okay. That's Sylvia. Is that you, Sylvia? Hi. Uh, yeah, it's me. Um, I, I think one of the one of the things looking at is the that earthly tabernacle was merely a pattern of the true tabernacle in the heavenlies. And the fact that, you know, Yeshua's role as high priest wasn't just an honorary title. He's, he's the king and the priest. And it says no, no one goes to the Father except through the Son. Is that we go, is we go before the throne. We boldly go before the throne of grace. That's going to him as our king and making our petitions known through prayer. It was only the high priest who enters that holy of holies. That's why we can only get to the father through the son we can we can enter into that the the holy place now because you wash your hands before you go and he says in Ephesians says wash your hands you sinners we can enter in that and we can bring our prayers before him but in that true tabernacle it's still Yeshua going before the face of the father because in these earthly bodies we still cannot withstand the fullness of his glory and he talks about us being a temple in Revelation, it mentions a temple and a tabernacle. And that word used for temple is the same words when he said, don't you know that your your body is the temple? Um, he'll tear the temple down and raise it again. His body was that as it was that it's the specific word for the holy of holies, not the tabernacle itself. And the, the whole purpose for that holy of holies was to house the glory of Elohim. 
So when that veil was rent, it's not in there. He was exposing their nakedness because the priest had already been so corrupt and showing that transfer, that word for the change in the priesthood, there's by necessity a change in the law. That word for um, transfer or the word for change of the priesthood is a transposition. It's a changing from one hand to another it's to to move something from one place to another from one person to another is that this shifted to yeshua and then also the, the and that's the word metatathemi um and that word does go go much deeper but then the but, and it says by necessity a change in the law is metathesis it is a transfer from the earthly to the heavenly is what that means so this now all takes place in the true tabernacle with Yeshua as our high priest who goes before the father in the fullness of the glory, because upon his resurrection and his ascension, he was restored back to the fullness. He was that he had emptied himself out um, to come as a man to do the work that he was called to do here. We've only been given a deposit of that spirit, a down payment until that resurrection when we will be filled with his glory again. So as we look through Revelation and look what those words are and where they're used, there will be a a tabernacle in the kingdom, the heavenly tabernacle, but there will be no need for the holy of holies, the temple in that, because we will be filled with his glory. The whole kingdom will be filled with his glory and in resurrected bodies will be able to withstand that. And, and it's at that time that we are serving. That's I think that was his intent of saying, blessed are those in that first resurrection that will then be serving as priest under him in that tabernacle. Um, we're really right now a priest in training um, because he says that same gospel, the gospel was given to them um, in the desert that they will become a kingdom of priests. It didn't happen be- because they broke covenant but also that same gospel was Galatians tells us given to Abraham. So he was looking forward to that kingdom of the come, that city whose architecture was Elohim himself, not built um, by the hands of the man. So so I think that's the shift. This is how we can enter in before him. It's through Yeshua. Um, All of these things that we see in this um, earthly temple was a picture of the things Yeshua was due when, um, you know, it's also, I think it's in Ephesians also, it says, if he did not resurrect, we'd still be dead in our sins. So it wasn't just the death, but that resurrection for him to serve as high priest, because it talks about that mitre that set on the high priest head, that holy set apart unto Yahweh. It says, because upon this, you will bear the sins of Israel. So it is him who's always before the father interceding on our behalf. And um, and one of the the words in First John, I mean, First John starts off about look, eternal life was manifested to us. They got to see a tangible taste of what eternity looks like in Yeshua's resurrected body. The same type of, even though they're spirit bodies, they're still very tangible bodies that Yeshua showed. They got to see the manifestation of that and experience it and when he goes on to explain how we're to live before Yah and then interact with one another he says I tell you these things so that you do not sin but if you do sin we have an advocate with the father and that word advocate can be traced back to the Hebrew word nakam which means to cause to repent we're used to the word teshiva that's our repentance that's turning from our sin and beginning to walk in the ways of Yah again but Nakama is used predominantly in having Yahweh repent of his wrath against us, which we see an example of in Moses in Exodus 32. when he says, you've, you've committed a great sin. Let me go back up. Be, let me go back up the mountain so I can make atonement for you and cause Yah to repent. And that's a fact what he did. It doesn't change who Yah is. But there is of him repenting towards his wrath, just like he did um, with Nineveh. So I think that's the picture of how we enter in. We still enter in through Yeshua. That's how no man goes to the Father except through the Son, because he is our high priest. And that role in the Holy of Holies is solely by the high priest until the day we're resurrected and we can withstand in these bodies the fullness of his glory and be filled 
with the fullness above and beyond just the deposit that he's given us, which is to assist us in walking this out here and now in these bodies. Thank you. Um, I know we're all, we've all spent time uh, using YouTube and listening to teachings and going over stuff, but uh, being through these Torah studies, I need to spend more time going back through and listening to us pour out the nuggets that, that we have in these Torah studies. Because, um, yeah, just, I don't know, just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going to need to go back and listen to what Sylvia said. <laughs> so, cram it in there. Um, but, okay, so uh, two questions then based off of what people have been saying. Um, so we can already come to the Father. We can already pray, right? Um, he, I believe he hears me every day. Um, so then what really is the point? of us needing to enter into the Holy of Holies. Again, I go back to the song that I've heard, you know, enter the Holy of Holies, right? The lady singing that song. Chevelle has the best uh, version personally, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chevelle, I'm sorry, what was it? No, no, not Chevelle. <laughs> yeah. What is it? What's that group? Not Chevelle. Shinedown? No. <laughs> no. No, no, is no, it, no, no. Is it Cutlass? Cutlass, that's what I was thinking of. Oh, yeah. Cutlass, Chevelle, you know, it's all the same, so. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> I'm here for you, brother. Thank you. <laughs> it's Cutlass. Mm. So, yeah, my question then would be, like, what's the what's the point of trying to enter into the Holy of Holies? If I can already have, you know, if I already have God's ear, and he's always working in my life and all these things, then what would be the point? Where Where is the presence of God at right now? To me, he's everywhere. No, I mean, we're, we're, to me, it's just me, and I'm, I may be completely wrong, but when it talks about the Holy of Holies, I'm thinking of where he, his spirit abides is the Holy of Holies. And mm -hmm. again, going back to what everyone said, the only way we can enter into that is through the blood of the Messiah. So it's, just, you know, for me, it's it's an actual place where the Father is. He's in the, in the heavenly realms. I would consider that to be any place he is is the Holy of Holies. Okay. Okay. And so, so when we're okay. praying and our petitions are going to his throne room, which could be considered the Holy of Holies. Uh -huh. Our prayers are delivered to him through our high priest, Yeshua, who is the under the Melchizedek order, the priesthood. Um, you know, um, and, I, and it's in uh, Hebrews chapter 7. I went and looked it up about the the, um, the priesthood. And um, it says, uh, For they indeed became priests without an oath, he, but he became priest with an oath by him who said to him, Jehovah has sworn and shall not regret. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. That's in verse 21 to verse 22. It says, by, by as much of this, Yeshua has become a guarantor of, of a better covenant. And indeed, those that became priests were many because they were prevented by death from continuing. So you see, he's saying basically real simple. The priests of Haran, um, they're going to die. They're, they're, they're mortal men. And... Um, <clears throat> It says in 25, therefore, he is also able to save completely those who draw near to Elohim through him, ever living to make intercession for them. So we know that Yeshua is always making intercession for us, no matter what. And if it's in the presence of Jehovah, to me, mm -hmm. that's the Holy of Holies. Wherever Jehovah is, like that's where he is, that is the Holy of Holies. Because the Holy of Holies here was, was a, again, it was a, a copy of what's already in heaven. So when the presence of our Father would come down and and and, ride, and he didn't sit on the, you know, we talked about this last week about that where we don't know where the mercy seat came from, Mitch, why that name came about, but his presence would come and settle upon that ark, that now became wherever the Father's Spirit is, and that is now the Holy of Holies. Period, mm -hmm. and the only ones who could bring anything before that were the high priest. Now the other priests in that temple could touch it; none of them could go in there. But now it's saying in, in Hebrews chapter seven that we're under the you know a better priesthood because there when it and, and also here it talks about there's no lineage and all that stuff you know for him it's because um, it's, it's it's you know the the bloodline of of Aaron was a lineage but with Yeshua it is is the perfect priesthood it says in twenty seven who does not need as those high priests who offer up slaughter offerings day by day. 
for uh, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. And this he did once and for all, and when he uh, offered up himself. For the Torah appoints a high priest as high priest, men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the Torah appoints the Son, having been perfected forever. So when you know, and I, and, you know, the whole the song that is sung um, by Cutlass, as I said, Cutlass, right? Yeah, <laughs> that you know, take me to the holy of the holies is taking me to a place, you know, to where my father is taking me into the holy of holies, and it's probably a cool song, and maybe they probably don't even really understand what they're singing either. But was it the prophet Isaiah that had his his lips were cleansed? You know, and he says, who will I send? He says, send me, you know, Isaiah. Um, But again, what I'm saying is that the Holy of Holies is actually where the Father abides. To me, that's enough. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I'll, I'll say I'm wrong. But where the Father actually abides is the Holy of Holies. And we're able to now come before the throne with boldness because of what Christ did for us. So in the spirit realm, at least, we can go to the Holy of Holies where our Father is through Messiah. All right. So that. Okay. Does, does that Hebrews leads 10. me into the next part of uh, when Ted brought up that the tabernacle here is just a pattern, right? And Moses is supposed to recreate the pattern that was shown to him. Um, what's the need of a Holy of Holies? And the ark and all that up in heaven, God's that full domain, right? So, is this the the heavenly tabernacle just like way bigger than the earthly one? And so, like the holy of holies, and that's where like God is sitting. And so, we just have a replica of that. Like I don't understand the need of a holy of holies up in heaven for Him. So, is it all a representation? Is it all the same as it is in heaven? And like that goes into like the roles of the priest. Is there, uh, is everyone in heaven allowed to enter into the holy of holies because they're all sanctified and holy already, or is it still the pattern is still the same? It's still just the high priest that gets to go into the holy of holies up in heaven. That's Yeshua, and then everything everything else can't enter into the holy of holies. It's still only the high priest up in heaven who gets to enter into the holy of holies. Well, there's only one high priest that's left, though. So yeah. Yeah, I think Mitch has got an answer for you on that one, though. It's a lot, man. It's a lot, dude. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna get a chance. I got way too many questions. I, I no, that's go. okay. Que- I always said questions are good. I may not have an answer, but questions are good. Okay. First of all, I'm going to go back to when Stephen was stoned, and he said he could see the heavens open up, and the Lord was standing next to the throne. He was standing. And moving right along, I'm getting a sense that I'm hearing that there's a warming up here. You got to warm up. Like you just come on the ball field and say, hey, get your glove. I'm going to get my glove. We're going to warm up before we start. For some reason, I'm get, I feel like I'm getting a little sense of that. But I'm going on to say I want to move all, along to the word uh, revision. There's been a revision here now. Well, I'm hearing that on earth as it is in heaven, but there were things in heaven that were in a way before things became a certain way here on earth. And I'm going with that. Where I'm going with that is Jesus came. And he had all his ministry and everything. Hold on a second. Hold on. You know, Jesus came. And we had all this ministry and all these miracles done, and he did what he did, and then he ascended. And if you ask me, there was a revision made here on earth when he was born and had his ministry and all this. But I go to the phrase then, on earth as it is in heaven. Now, was there a revision made there at the same time that lined up with what happened here? So before it happened here, come on, just bear with me, man. All these are thoughts. I'm just brainstorming stuff. Is there was a holy of holies and nobody could go into and all this, that, and the other, and this, that, and the other. But there was a point when the veil was rented. So the holy of holies wasn't sealed no more. 
It wasn't sealed no more when the veil was written. There was the barrier. There was a barrier. Part of the barrier, even though it was a curtain or whatever, it was torn apart. It was open. It was wide open now. So hold on, said just hold on, said y'all work this out. I'm just coming up with stuff. That's all. Just hold on. I'm just coming up with stuff here, you know. So as for Dean. I never had to warm up a moment when I had to come to the Father for something, even though I did. I wanted to acknowledge and give him praise for this, that, and the other. And I wanted, if I felt in the moment that there was something and I needed to be repentant of, so maybe he would be more receptive, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe. But I know I've had times where I didn't have time in my heart and in my spirit for how I felt for no warm-up. I need you now. I need you right now. You know, and even, even though my emergency doesn't mean it's an emergency to him, I understand that. But it just seems to me there was times when he took it to be an emergency for him and in him because it was the only way something was going to pan out for my well-being, whether it be in a spiritual or physical way or whatever. So I guess I'm kind of saying all this. There's, I think there's answers to be had to all this in certain ways, and I don't know what they are. Are people to address some of the stuff I've said in certain ways? But... We have, we're sealed in his spirit the day we received him. See, that's the key there. Who has received him and who hasn't received him on this planet. And people who haven't, they can do whatever they want and say whatever they want. I don't think our God is going to move like, like that unless it's all been predestined to that point for them. You know, which means the spirit was involved anyway. Come on, man. So, you know, uh, we have a conduit. I like the word conduit because when you get conduit run and you stuff something in it, it's there. It is there. It's going straight to where the right. other end of the Spoken conduit is. Spoken good for a, uh, your electrician. So right. it's like but I'm just yeah. saying, for wherever the other end of that conduit's there, it's, it's that's where it's going to arrive at. It's going to arrive at. So again, you know, I'm kind of, uh, uh, you know, I'm kind of scatterbrained right this minute. If you figured that out, but yeah, <laughs> but I'm just saying, if there's anything that has suggested you need to warm up, I don't see that unless the spirit prompts you. Unless he's prompting you, unless there's a barrier there, you have all to get. So I go get this ready before you come talk to me, okay? You know. But I don't think you have to warm up for one thing. And I think, like, if we need Lord on the spot, I think he can be Lord on the spot. Because nothing, 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 you know, he can't do. And all this, that, and the other. But, again, back to the thought about we feel like we have arrived to come to a certain point in our walk with certain things. You know, I think there was some revision made in heaven so it kept itself parallel with revisions that were made here on earth especially if he made them his son him come into flesh so that's an interesting thought there you know as far as is there a holy of holies up there that we have to do something to penetrate if, if there is the only thing we have to do to penetrate it is receive the gift that he has offered to us, which seals us in his spirit. We're on. The switch is on in our life. That baby's on. That light don't come on unless that thing is on. You know, it's waiting on the other side of that switch. It's waiting on the other side of that switch. But when you hit it, bang, it's on. So, you know, y'all put all this together, what I've said, and think about it, and give me the sum of it. I don't have to... Ask. I don't have the sum of it, really, but I'll be honest with you. Honest engine, just as sure as I was standing back there, I feel that 
I wanted to hear what you had to say. <laughs> and look at where he's at. He's right here. He's right here. You know, it's and you know what? That's not a coincidence. <laughs> Don't. Don't you do that. <laughs> well, thank you for warming the mic up for him. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> yeah. After thank Mitch, you, Dean. then All right, which, Kyle, you're which, up. After Mitch. We're, the subject of approaching God, okay? God hears the, the voice of his people. He's always heard the cry of his people. Uh, when they were in Egypt and they were in bondage, he heard the cry of his people. So, so God hears his people. He always hears his people. But the, uh, the portion that we're reading about, you, you might notice that um, Aaron has to be stripped down naked. He has to be washed by Moses. He has to have the linen garments put on. And then they had to do the same thing with all of the sons. They had to be washed. They had to have the linen garments put on. Then they had to go in consecration for seven days. Uh, and then they had to come out of consecration. Then they had to sacrifice a bull, which is the biggest thing you can sacrifice because they're leaders and, and overseers. So they had to sacrifice a bull. And then they put the, the blood on the tip of the ear and the blood, the blood on, the, on the, uh, the hand and to put the blood on the toe. And so the point I'm getting at is, is we can all cry out to God, and God will hear us. No matter where we are or what's going on in our life, if we are one of his children, he will hear us call out to him. But if we want to get close to God, we want to go, we want to feel, uh, we want to get into the essence of who God is, the closer we get to God, the cleaner we have to be. And you can see that in everything that we're reading about here in the temple. It's all a matter of the closer you get to the glory of God, the cleaner you've got to be. The, and that's, uh, it's like that relationship. It's like Joe's talking about tuning in. You're, you're tuned completely in. And so um, I think what we can get out of this portion, a lot of what we can get out of this portion, is looking at the fact that the priests had to be consecrated. And they had to have the blood on the ear so they would be hearing the word of God. Blood on the hands so they're doing the work of God, and blood on the toes so they're walking in the ways of God. And uh, these are, I think, the, the important symbols that we're going to get out of this section. And, and how we approach God, uh, it depends on our relationship with God in that, whether we're, you know, we, we can approach God and we can talk to God, but the closer that we get to God, the more tuned in we're going to be, the clearer we're going to hear God, and the, the, the more successful we're going to be in our walk. Okay, Kyle, you're next. Amen. Well spoken there, Mitch. Well spoken. Um, so we are... Um, I, I want to address what, what Dean was saying. So, um, and I was, I, was, I was just speaking to, to, to Joe on some of this stuff uh, the other night. Um, you know the song, was that the uh, five minute conversation we had? Yeah, the five minute, <laughs> the five minute that was three hours. Um, um, we all know the song "Come as You Are," right? Come as you are, all right, um, or just as I am, you know that sort of stuff. Um, in a, in a, in addressing in addressing what what Dean was saying. Um, they're both right. So here, here's what I mean. We, we, if you take someone who is just coming into faith, right? Um, there's that brokenness. And that brokenness is a place where God says, okay, I can work with this. Um, and he receives you and he comforts you and he, and he, and he does those things. Um, but all too often we see, I know I, this happened in my life. It's okay. I'm good now. And we move away from that presence rather than pursuing it deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, and even the most uh, basics of Christianity is we know that there's a sanctification process. A lot don't, uh, a lot of people don't choose to go through that. Uh, but there, but, but, but understanding even the basics of his word, you know, that there's a sanctification process. So looking at the, the, the depth of the tabernacle and the, and the, 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 the 
procedures and all the rituals, if you want to call it that, that the that the priest had to go through through for uh, cleansing and purification or sanctification is to is so that they can get closer and closer to that presence of the father uh so that the so that the voice so that he can be seen more clearly so that he could be heard more distinctly so he can be heard more frequently that's what the purification and the sanctification is all about is to be uh more echad more one with him so that we are walking in the spirit continually and i think a lot of times um we as believers accidentally stumble upon some of that stuff and we just think oh it's just you know i can i can pray to the father and he can hear me always well the the scriptures tell us otherwise the scriptures tell us that not every prayer is heard so what is it that we're doing even if it's accidentally what is it that we're doing that's allowing our prayers to be heard because we i mean i know i know myself i can tell when um when 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 the presence is there i can tell when it's not and i feel like i'm getting nowhere so that's that's my cue to okay put yourself in check what do i what do i need to do here uh psalms even before you know david wrote in psalms well, way before yeshua ever came uh he he says you know i know you do not desire the sacrifice of bulls lambs and goats the sacrifice you seek is a is a is a broken spirit and a contrite heart and it's those crying out to the Father. He hears us. He hears the voice of his people. Well, he hears us when we are giving praise, when we are worshiping, when we are giving thanks. Well, that's what the scriptures tell us. Again, going back to Psalms, you know, it's enter into his gates with thanksgiving, enter to, into his courts with praise. And when you enter that gate, what do you have? You have the sacrifice that you have the, the 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 brazen altar. You have the sacrifice. What is that? That's the broken spirit and the contrite heart. You know that you have the 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 the, the labor. That's the 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 sanctification where it's I want to be in more pure in your presence. I want to become more like the Messiah. I want to become more like my King. How do I do so? Seek the inner parts of me. So whether we realize it or not, we. <clears throat> If you are acting out those things, that's what you're doing. You're, you're going through that process of the tabernacle. You're going uh, of the high priest or of the priest of purification, of sanctification to get into his presence. So it's not a um, it's not something that we need to look at as a as a work. Right. Because I, I think that's kind of the contrast. Uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Dean, but it kind of seemed like that was the contrast of where you were going is that it's not that difficult to go to the father. Uh, And it's really not when you've spent a lot of time on your knees. Um, You know, he knows his people. He knows the people that the Holy spirit dwell in. So, so yeah, it's, it's not that difficult. Your, your, your prayers are heard, but how much more so and how much more outpouring of the Holy spirit could there be if we did spend instead of a few minutes a day if we spend a few hours a day or even all day or three days going through a process of purification and sanctification or even fasting withholding from relationships with our wives saying i want to be without everything that sustains my life and my flesh and i will forsake all of that so that i can draw closer to you and in those times he honors that I can't tell you how many times I've, I've heard someone say, if you want to have your prayers heard, if you want to have your prayers answered, fast. Well, that's not a, a you know, it's not a, a, a magic word or a, a thing that just automatically makes God listen to you. It's a process. It's a process that he does, desires from us where we, where we die to self, where we put off our flesh daily. It's where we put off our flesh so that we can become more, of him less of us to allow more of him and the other thing to keep in mind too is this he doesn't need to go through a purification process to speak to us or to even speak through us he can use a donkey i'm proof of that he had me on stage once right so he can use he 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 can come to us at any time no matter where we are but in order to come to him we got to have that broken spirit and that contrite heart 
we humble ourselves before our king. And whether we realize it or not, that's what we're doing. And if we recognize that, maybe we can say, huh, well, how much more so can I humble myself? How much more broken and contrite can I be? How much more can I put off so that I can draw closer to you? So there's my 30 shekels. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> let me, um, yeah, just working off of the things that Kyle said and that Mitch shared is that, um, you know, the, the, the process of, I mean, on the miter of the high priest, on his, on his miter, it says, Kadosh I mean, it's, it's right there, holy unto God. You know, he before he even goes into the Holy of Holies, he makes atonement for Israel. He makes atonement for himself. He makes atonement for the world. When he actually goes into the Holy of Holies, it wasn't it's not about the world anymore. It's about him and Yehovah. There's no longer, I mean, Israel's been taken care of. The family's been taken care of. The world's been taken care of. At that point, it's just between the high priest and Yahovah. The, the high priest is actually ministering to the creator of heaven and earth. It's no longer about the world. He left all of that behind. He left all the desires that, that were worldly, he left behind. He cleansed himself. He purified himself. He brought nothing. He came in there baggage free, you know. <clears throat> I just think that's... You know, people say, well, I'm a minister to the people. Well, in this particular instance, the high priest is not ministering to the people. He's ministering to God. He's not necessarily going in there with the desires of the people. He's going there to find out what, what, what Yehovah desires of his people. He's not telling God. He's learning from God. I think that that's the, the problem. We go into the Holy of Holies and we say, I need this from you, God. Not at this point. When you go into the Holy of Holies, let God tell you what he needs from you. That's my thoughts. So one thing I thought of listening to what Dean was saying, and he, you know, he said it a couple of different times, and I'm not you know, arguing for or against that, but um, just have a alternative way of looking at it, perhaps. So where he talked about there, because there was a revision in something here on earth, that there perhaps could or should have been a revision of something in heaven. And I, I would look at it a little bit differently. I would look at it as heaven is the goal heaven is what we aspire to um, it, it's God created everything to be able to dwell with man and then when man screwed it up he withdrew back to his heavenly dwelling but there wasn't anything wrong with his heavenly dwelling Nothing needed to be revised there, but what was going on on earth needed to be a revised a little bit in order to make it a little bit closer to what he originally intended it to be. That's just a thought, just my two shekels on, on that heaven and earth thing that we talked about. Glory. So we keep talking about the tabernacle, the temple, how and how there's a process, how we start in one place and work our way closer and closer to Yah. Um, but I think that that revision that we're seeing is God didn't want all that stuff between us. He wanted just us and the blood. That's it. He wanted, uh, he didn't want us to have to go through all of that to get to him. Um, you know, Kyle was saying something that he was saying about, um, 
going, I, don't know, I forgot how he worded it, but I know that back, way back when, when I first started going to church, you know, you go to church, they'd have those three songs in the beginning, you know, and it would take me those full three songs to start feeling like, okay, I'm ready to worship now, you know, now, now all of a sudden you can hear somebody say something, you, you could turn on worship music and you're automatically there. That's where we need to be. And yes, if, and, and that spending time hitting our knees in the morning, that, when I'm in deep prayer, that's when I feel like I am in the Holy of Holies because I have entered into the presence of the Lord. You know, and I can pray and it not be that. I can pray and I'm praying. I'm asking God for stuff or I'm asking him to heal people. Whatever you're asking him, you're just, you're spent, you know, you're talking to him. But there is a big difference in being able to slip into the presence of the Lord. Joe, like you were saying, you know, you, you felt Yeshua there. That, that's a different thing. That, that is being in the presence of the Lord. And the only way for us to do that is that it does take work. It's, it's like getting ready for a date or something. I don't know. You know, you're preparing yourself for something, and we need to start early in the morning every single day. Well, if, if you're a good date, you prepare yourself. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, there, there's, there's a preparation, preparation. That's so hard to say. In the morning, that, that you have yourself. Hush. That you have yourself ready for the presence of the Lord. So that at any time, if you see someone who needs prayer, you need someone that you want it to, if you prepare yourself in the morning to be in the presence of the Lord, then whenever the Lord moves, you just slide into it. You know, you just do the kingdom work that he tells you to do because you're walking in that. Yeah, but, and, it, and it's an easy thing to do, but yet it's the hardest thing to do, you know? Yeah. Yep, I guess that's all I got. <laughs> okay, I, I don't want to fight you for it. I, I don't want to fight you for it. You just got up kind of quick. What I, what I find interesting is here we have Aaron and we have Moses. And I don't recall Moses ever walking into the Holy of Holies. Yet he had a relationship with the Father like no other. And and and, and the, I think that the Holy of Holies and Aaron and the high priest and stuff, there was a purpose for them. There may still be the purpose there, but I think maybe we're looking at the, kind of, I don't want to say wrong, but, you know, <clears throat> the whole process Aaron goes through is an example of what, like like Mitch said and, and what... Uh, Joel said an example of of getting closer to the Father, <clears throat> but you know, you know, we're talking about like a song and stuff. I don't know how many songs have been wrong about the Bible, you know, <laughs> and so, so, I mean, it's a good question that Ryan has, but you know, I'm kind of a, of the uh, belief that I'm not walking into the Holy Holies anytime soon. You know, because one, it doesn't exist on earth. And <clears throat> I don't know that we'll be walking before the throne of, of the Father in heaven at any time without at least Yeshua standing in front of me. Um, because he's really, he, he's the mediator. He's the one that is standing between us and the Father. Because even though we're born again, we're still, we still have sin. And so, so, uh, Holy Holies and Aaron and we're, are all representations um, of what is in heaven, and and so I don't know. To me, it, we've gone around this so long today. It's I'm almost confused about some of it, but it, it, it's just you do see with, with Moses, he has this relationship that Aaron didn't have with the Father, and and, and so and you look at other uh, individuals in Scripture, whether it's David or whether it's Joshua. You know, they have their own unique relationship with God. And God blesses them or he does certain things in their life. And we're, we're like in awe and we're like, I wish that was in my life or something like that, you know. But here we're living our life out and, and we have to uh, take these examples to go before the Father. I mean, there is a, is a, a, a stripping away of things in our life 
to get close to the Father, just like the high priest had to do to get to the Holy of Holies. And you look at Moses, Moses' life was walking with the Father, was leading the children of Israel. That was his purpose. That was his life. And so he had to set this example, you know. And so I think we're called to set an example also, you know, just like Israel was called, just like everybody, you know, that is a believer, we're called to walk and, and to show that light of the Father and, and the Yeshua and um, is done with that stripping away. And, and, and in part, I've, I've been in, in, in presence of the Holy Spirit, I, I wouldn't say the Father, in my prayer closet, things like that. You can call that a type of holy of holies, I guess you could say. Um, so anyway, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with all this. I just I just wanted to say, you know, well, Moses had this relationship. He had a unique relationship that Aaron didn't have. And Aaron could only go to him, you know, once a year in the holy of holies. Not that he didn't uh, uh, have a relationship with the Father, but but Moses, he had this, he went to the mountain, you know, forty days and and all all kinds of things, and so anyway. Um, yeah, um, so I want to add something from the the previous chapter about um, something else that sort of remains with me from having read this the these chapters. Um, is that Aaron or the high priest for the um, prayer concerns of the 12 tribes on his heart before the Lord. And, you know, is it that at all times, we're, we're exhorted to pray without ceasing, and is it that, that at all times, um, I, you know, um, keep the prayers for the saints before me? And um, anyway, um, so it's written somewhere before, Hold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God and such we are. And it speaks about having fellowship with God. <laughs> Speak louder. Okay. Um, but yes, so that um, as we, the more that we develop in this sanctification, the greater our fellowship with God and the other saints can become. Um, and the more that we can, the more that consistently that we sense his presence um it's written also um in the message that the apostles gave in acts to repent and be converted that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the lord and so forth and um, it's so it is so refreshing to um to be in his presence so then um some let me see there's, oh, there's a missing verse here but um it's a, there's also um yes First Corinthians 4, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory. And um, so that is God's goal with us that many people, I think, miss. Um, but um, we, um, let's see, so just as in baptism, representatively, we set as aside the body of sins and um, figuratively bring the death of Christ over them. That um, that his sacrifice then um, let's see um, that that the heavenly calling that rests over us um, if we're aware of it and we walk in it we become more and more sanctified and I don't I think I should have taken notes so I could have presented that a little better but anyway. <laughs> All right, Kyle, you're next. Um, just to tack on to, to, to what we've said earlier, um, and and by the way, it's it's absolutely beautiful it, that this topic is has gained so much attention um, in w amongst us. That 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 that's a that's a, a beautiful thing to me that that so many people find so much interest in being in the presence of the father you know um so there's a there's a there's a couple of ways that we approach in prayer um and what i mean by that is is uh, our the most high holds many titles um, one of those titles is father. One of those titles is king. Um, 
Lord of Hosts. Um, and I'm sure we're going to be digging into some of this a little more deeply later on, but um, I think if we recognize that and we um, call unto him for what we are seeking, um, it, 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 it can humble us to recognize the authority that he holds for the situation. But how beautiful is it? How amazing is our God? That, so, that, that folks like us who, who understand that Torah is eternal and are seeking out the deeper things in this manner, where we're looking at the tabernacle and the significance of, of each individual item and that sort of stuff and how it applies to our life and how it applies to pro, approaching his th throne and how it applies to um, being filled with the spirit and how it applies to all these deeper things. That's awesome. But how beautiful is it that someone who's not in the understanding of being Torah observant, how beautiful is it that you're a, a brand new Christian, a brand new believer, can still have their, their, their prayers heard and not even know, have no understanding of the process because they're able to come with that broken spirit, with that contrite heart, with that humbling, with that um, childlike faith where they can come to him as a father and still have their words heard. How beautiful is that, 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 the, that the process is still there even though they're unaware of the process if that makes sense, if they're, they're, they're unaware of the details of how they're able to accomplish what they're accomplishing in prayer, but they're able to do so because, well, deep calls to deep, right? The, 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 the father is, has impressed it upon, uh, I know he did for me, you know, before I knew anything about keeping Torah or anything like that, I was a broken down, nothing of a man. And I, I knew his presence was there. I knew, I knew my prayers were heard and I knew nothing of this. So how amazing is it that he still provides a way? And it's, um, it's even more amazing that those who truly, truly seek get to find those deeper things the honor of kings. I think it's beautiful. Just wanted to share that. And real quick, I know you can't see it. I don't know if, if he'll post it on Telegram or not, but uh, Tommy sent me a text message that he's dressed up as a high priest today <laughs> with a full, full garb and everything on there. That's really cool. Go ahead, Dino. Yeah, you know, with, with all this uh, dialogue, now, first of all, thank you, Ted, for your comment. And, uh, you know, what comes to my mind with the simplicity is the phrase, in spirit and in truth. And where does that take me? It takes me to a woman at the well. And uh, she was talking blah, blah, blah. Our father Jacob dug this well, and he drank from it himself and all this. And you Jews, y'all talk about in Jerusalem, this temple and all. But what did Jesus say? He said, there'll come a day where neither one, the mountain here that you worship on, or the temple in Jerusalem, because we'll be able to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Which means you can put on a diving bell, and go about a thousand feet under the ocean if you want to. Or you can climb the highest mountain. Or run off in the farthest distant corner that you think there is on this earth. But we can still worship him. And be in touch with him in spirit and truth. Which means 
it can mean a lot of things, you know. But I know one thing. I just don't feel like I have to warm up to him, even though I think he can prompt us sometimes in a moment in our life and say, what you doing bringing this to me when I'm on? Do you take care of this? And you'll be surprised how much this might take care of this instead of circumventing around your repentance and something and all. But in spirit and in truth, though, every time, every time. That's, that's a big phrase. To me, it got bigger today. I come to understand what that means a little more day because I'm simple anyway, but whatever. You know. <laughs> it's, it's Thank you, Dean. Can I say something real quick, Rudy? Um, the thing we got to realize, too, this, this is me. Could again be wrong, but there's always a physical and there's always a spiritual. And so when. It's something we haven't really touched on a lot, and it reminded me when I saw Tommy dressed up in the uh, high priest, which is a really neat outfit they got. I know Ray Ray had one that he uh, dressed up in before, right? Dorothy made it. Dorothy made it. Ray and Brenda had it. Oh, so that's part of the one that Tommy's wearing? Yes. Okay, yeah, I guess it's, it's a really nice looking. Yeah. I mean, it looks really great. But it takes me to the point of the spiritual and the physical, and on the physical side is that there's frequencies and, for lack of a better term, electricity involved with our Heavenly Father. Mm-hmm. And so when you bring something and it's not in the proper order, then death can occur. And I think for me as a newer believer in this understanding, my first thought was God was just mad and he killed him. Yeah. You know, you look at the Ark of the Covenant when, when David was transported. And what was, you remember the guy's name? What was his name? Reached out and uh, he touched it to steady it and he died. Yeah. Well, what was that? Uza. Uza. Uza should not have touched it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but when he touched it, because there was power that radiated from the art period because the way it was made. So when he touched it, he died. And I, the way and the way my eyes are looking at it right now is not because. He was unclean or unholy it's because that ark had power still in it. And when he touched it, it was going to kill him. And it's just like with the high priest. When you look at the, we, and again, we haven't really, and there's been years in the past where we went more into what they're wearing and why they're wearing linen, why they, all this, the way that they're wearing things. Even when we just read and they talked about the bells and the pomegranate and all that stuff. And we can go into the, to the design of their, their outfit. There's all kinds of things in that. But a lot of that was an insulator also to, to protect them when they went into the presence of God. Yeah. And so and, and from a standpoint of, yes, if you're unclean, so to speak, you ain't going to walk in there. But, but on the physical side, if you walk in there and you're not prepared in a certain way, you're going to die anyway because your, your body can't handle it. Yeah. And these materials and these elements are actually absorbing and taking care of that so that when the high priest goes in, he doesn't go... You're done. So <clears throat> my best analogy on that is because we've been doing a lot of wiring in this house over in St. George. And, and uh, Dean and uh, um, uh, Austin have pretty much wired the whole house except for one side. This is old 1950-something wiring that when we opened up the floor and looked at it, there was parts of the wiring that was literally wires exposed, laying across metal, <laughs> laying across wood. <laughs> No ground. Yeah. You know, if you just, you know, Dean's face says a, a thousand words when he looks, he goes, ah. he starts doing like this. And he goes, uh, man, I went to the wall and there was no ground. He started telling me all this stuff. I said, well, he goes, I'm going to need so I got whatever we needed. We got the wire. We got it all run and everything. But the thing I know about electricity, and I don't know a lot about it, other than if you don't respect it, it can kill you. I don't, it's not a way I ever want to go. If you go into the presence of God, which is energy, and you're not respectful of the way you're to approach his throne room, we're talking about the throne room, if you're not respect, respectful of that, then you yourself and the physical are going to die because you didn't follow the protocol that was in place to begin with. And so that's what I look at this in this teaching that we're reading about is the fact that he had to take a bath. He, like you said, he had to get naked. He had to get a bath, get robed. All these things had to take place before he could go in. And so 
I just it just came to my mind again when I saw Tommy's outfit that there's a physical part of this that God is a God of energy of power and if you don't respect that on that level mm-hmm. it's a good chance you're gonna die when the two sons brought strange fire and they died it's because they brought an element in that didn't work it wasn't conductive with what God already had in place and it killed them mm. so that's my shekel and a half there good okay <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Joe. Okay, so um, Redeem, mm-hmm. you'll have a word, and then I have a question just to kind of throw out before we move into the half Torah. So. Okay. So I think uh, something that uh, Chris uh, mentioned something. Hey, this can be uh, this can get even get confusing for uh, people who are just starting or maybe listening uh, for the first time and. Uh, you know, Kyle brought up the uh, the fact that, hey, what about even our prayers? Forget about going to the Holy of Holies. Sometimes we have a scriptures that say that even our prayers are not being heard. And you're just on earth. You're not even coming in front of the, you're not trying to come in front of the throne of the Father. Uh, and, and you're praying just, you're asking something from earth. And your prayers are not uh, being even heard. Uh, so the the scripture that uh, I looked uh, looked it up and it says, we know that uh, God does not listen to who to sinners, but if anyone is a, a worshiper of God and does His will, does His will, God listens to him. So that's John uh, chapter nine verse thirty one. Um, For the eyes of uh, Jehovah are on the righteous. And his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of Jehovah is against those who do evil. First Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 12. Um, and so and there is a list of, you can go uh, and you can actually look that up. Um, another one that, uh, uh, that uh, the Spirit uh, reminded me of, there is a scripture, and uh, I don't know exactly where it is, maybe you can help me. Uh, it says that if the if husband... Um, like oppresses uh, his wife, uh, something along those lines, uh, then God will not hear your prayer. Yeah, uh, and I think and I think it works both. Uh, same thing, wives. If you are, let's say, emotional abusing your husband, then uh, God, it doesn't matter how much time you're gonna spend on your knees and then all of that, unless you're repenting for that, <laughs> uh, He will not hear our prayers. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are just random, random. <laughs> I, I, uh, Joe, you always, uh, you, you always talk about it like, hey, if I look at you, it's not really meant for you. I'm just, it's, it's. Oh, whatever. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, but it really comes down to even how to actually Yeshua, the way he was praying. Uh, and that's something that Lori uh, brought up. Uh, she said, you know, wake up early in the morning, right? That's what Yeshua did. Uh, you know, one of the reasons I think that he was doing that is because he, he, would, um, he would actually want to spend the quiet time between uh, him and the Father without any uh, distractions. And, uh, and then he was able to hear from the Father and get uh, all the plans what he uh, what he was supposed to do that day uh you know so that's uh that's uh, that's a uh, that's a uh, one aspect uh you know be willing to maybe sacrifice and wake up early in the morning you guys please pray for me that uh, that's my struggle right now uh, and uh, then are you willing to go and uh, uh spend time in the word of god it says that meditate on the word uh, day and night uh or in the morning and in the evening um, so are you willing to take, uh, let's say, at least 20, 30 minutes to be in the Word of God, you know? Um, let's see, what else is there? Uh, fasting. Are we, Yeshua said, uh, when I leave, my followers, my disciples will fast. Are we willing to sacrifice uh, some of the, the hours we, we spend of, with eating, uh, over and over and over, are we willing to sacrifice some of that 
so we can be closer uh, to God, uh, right? Uh, and those are just, uh, that's really, I would say, the, I don't know, the, uh, the, the yeah, the, uh, yeah to, to get you started, uh, you know, so if anyone is thinking, uh, you know, about running into all the way to heaven and, and even in the spirit and right to the closest possible to the Father, and we, uh, you know, we haven't done any any of that, uh, any of our preparation, or as Joe was uh, talking about, getting being prepared. Uh, then, uh, I w me personally, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, uh, so, that's just my two shekels and glory to God. Hallelujah. Seeing we are to receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, turn this to let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire, which is followed by let brotherly love continue. And I think in all this also um, the verse about drawing near to God applies that um, it says that you can read it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, in preparation for the half Torah reading, it's from Ezekiel 43, verses 10 through 27. So to kind of wrap up this discussion about the preparation of the priests and all, why Aaron's descendants and not Moses's? I got a theory. <laughs> Let's hear it. I got one too. Um, Moses uh, Moses actually was acting in a priestly role uh, when he went up to the top of the mountain he was in communion with Yahweh I mean that's even more than what Aaron ever experienced in the, in the, uh, the Holy of Holies <coughs> I think God just had different tasks for them but I think it's my opinion that, that Moses was acting in uh, in somewhat of a Mel Melchizedek priesthood role. And uh, the two can't mix. And so God had chose Aaron, you know, to, to be the uh, head of the Levitical priesthood at that time. That's it's a tough question. Yeah, one idea regarding that, and Kyle, I'll, I'll, I'll let you have the last word perhaps. Um Perhaps it's because when Moses had his first encounter with the, the uh, spirit at the burning bush and expressed his reluctance to serve this role as what God was calling him to do, um, that God chose his brother and his brother's descendants to be the priests, whereas Moses and his descendants, or Basically, the rest of the Levites uh, would be doing the kind of the grunt work associated with uh, the tabernacle. Um, and this comes from um, John Parsons' Hebrew for Christians website. Uh, he says, prophetically, even though Moses himself was a type or a picture of the Messiah, Yeshua, he was unable to enter into the land of ultimate promise and the entire priesthood system based on the Mishkan and later the temple was destined to be superseded by the greater priesthood after the order of Melchizedek from Hebrews 7. So Moses was the type and shadow of the priesthood of Melchizedek and Aaron was the earthly Levitical priesthood. Kyle, wrap it up please. I'm sorry, man. I know you're trying to get on to the half tour. Um, I, I, I did. Well, I was going to pose this as a question, but uh, rather than posing as a, as a question and calling anybody out and all that stuff, um, I'll just make a statement. Um, something that I have learned to do, and uh, I'll just say that it has been very effective in my prayer, is when I pray, I've made it a practice to 
ask for forgiveness of sin, uh, specifically if I know that there's something that I've done. Um, but in addition to that, if there's something that I have done unknowingly, um, to, to seek forgiveness in that, but in addition to that, ask that that be revealed so that that's something that I can remove from my, from my flesh, from my life. But, but, uh, a, an, a reoccurring regular basis of asking forgiveness of sin, um, so that I can be, so that I may approach, you know, him in prayer. Um, and, and, um, and yeah, anyway, sorry. I would just suggest that to make that a, a regular thing. Make it brief. It's kind of a, a simple way of thinking about it, but uh, Moses already had a job, and so he was already had his hands full. He would probably wouldn't have had a whole, whole lot of time to be the high priest. I do find it interesting that it's a family business, though, because you got you got Moses. He's a Levite, and his brother Aaron's a Levite, and and also the, the aspect of uh, Aaron is older. I mean, maybe, I don't know if he was a firstborn, if he was before Miriam or not, but anyway, that's kind of my thought is Moses has got his hands full. He's already got it delegated out to the leadership, so. I was saying the same thing, Chris, and then some, uh, yeah, sure, it's just um, sheep leaping, but um, also uh, it made me think, too, back to the fact that the father had already drawn Aaron out. Because when he's having this conversation with Moshe about, hey, I need you to go do this, and of course Mo- Moshe's like, you know, I'm so of speech, you know, you sure you got the right guy, I'm, you know, I'm just yada, yada, yada. And finally, kind of in the wording, it kind of sounds like y'all always getting a little bit frustrated with Moses. And he says, look, he says, your brother's on the way, and he's going to be. So the father was already doing something in Aaron's life because Aaron was on the way. So there was a calling out for both of them to, to, to walk in a role that the father had for them. So there, I, I agree with Chris on that one, that the role that Moshe had was a specific role, and he didn't, he couldn't do double duty. You know what I mean? Like he's not going to go into do all. And besides that, he was already in the presence of the father. He's up on he's up, he's ones up on the mountain. You know, he's the one glowing later and everything else for being in the, in the glory and the presence of God. But that was something that I thought also that I, I backed that up that he's, he had his role and his brother had a role to play also. So. Yeah, along those same lines, um, you know, we could ask a question, why did God call a, a Levite Moses in the first place? Well, I think that we can see, we, we really get excited when we see some of the, the puzzle pieces coming together, and, and God allows us to see that, and that's really cool that we get to see that. But there's a lot of puzzle pieces that we can't see and we'll never see, but God has it all worked out ahead of time. And the fact that the reason why I brought that up, why would he call a Levite? Well, you go back to the blessing that uh, Jacob gave his sons, and uh, you know it said that uh, Levite and uh, Levi and uh, Simeon would be scattered among the nations. Well, Simeon ended up scattered and disappeared, but Levite, because of the, their righteousness, were also scattered, not among the nations, but among the, the, the people. The Levite was also scattered. So God makes all these pieces come together. Even when we screw it up, God still was able to put the pieces together. It's like I heard a guy say, you know, uh, a, a teenage girl gets pregnant, and, uh, you know, certainly that's not God's will, but God can take the child and weave it right back into the, the, the picture of the girl's life and turn it into, you know, something great. So God sees all the pieces you know we can't see all the pieces but he sees all the pieces thank you for that word yeah, I needed that. good word we needed to hear today right yep. daniel yep. <laughs> okay word. ezekiel 37 let's hear it 43 43 right? yep okay. <laughs> 10 through 27 i'm yeah right Son of man, explain the house to the house of Israel, and when they are ashamed of their crookedness, they shall measure the measurements. And since they shall be ashamed of all that they did, make known to them the design of the house and its structure, and its exits, and its entrances, and its entire design, and all its laws, and all its forms, and all its tarot. And write it down before their eyes, so that they observe its entire design, and all its laws, and shall do them. 
this is the Torah of the house. Upon the mountaintop, all the boundary of it, all around, is most set apart. See, this is the Torah of the house. And these are the measurements of the slaughter place in cubits. That cubit being one cubit and a handbreadth, and the base of one cubit high and one cubit wide, with a rim all around its edge of one span. And this is the upper part of the slaughter place. And from the base on the ground of the lower ledge, two cubits, and the width of the ledge, one cubit, and from the smaller ledge to the larger ledge, four cubits, and the width of the ledge, one cubit. And the slaughter place hearth is four cubits high and four horns extending upward from the hearth. And the slaughter place hearth is 12 cubits long and 12 wide, square at its four corners. And the ledge is 14 long and 14 wide on its four sides with a rim of half a cubit around it and its base one cubit all around and its steps face east. And he said to me, son of man, thus said the master Yehovah, these are the laws for the slaughter place on the day when it is made, for offering ascending offerings on it, and for sprinkling blood on it. And you shall give a young bull for a sin offering to the priests, the Levites, who are of the seed of Zadok. The approach unto me declares the master, Yehovah. And you shall take some of its blood and put it on the four horns of the slaughter place, on the four corners of the ledge, and on the rim around it, and shall cleanse it and make, it atone make an atonement for it. You shall take the bull of the sin offering and shall burn it in the appointed place of the house outside the set apart place. And on the second day, you bring a male goat, a perfect one, for a sin offering. And they shall cleanse the slaughter place as they cleansed it with the bull. When you have ended cleansing it, bring a young bull, a perfect one, and a ram from the flock, a perfect one. And you shall bring them before Yehovah and the priests shall throw salt on them and offer them up as an ascending offering to Yehovah. Prepare a goat for a sin offering daily for seven days, and prepare a young bull and a ram from the flock, perfect ones. For seven days they shall make atonement for the slaughter place and cleanse it, and ordain it. And when these days are completed, it shall be on the eighth day and thereafter that the priests make your ascending offerings and your peace offerings on the slaughter place, and I shall accept you, declares the Master, Yehovah. Amen. All right, so um, touch on something that Kyle said, um, and also also what we just read. It says there at the very end, um, you know, of course, we're going right back into the, um, the offerings um, and sacrifices here. And um, so he gives this word. The, f the Father gives this word for the regulations of the um, offerings, and sacrifices and then at the end he says then i will accept you says the sovereign lord and to touch on what you were saying kyle um uh that when we when before we gave our lives to messiah and our our lives were a complete and total wreck um and we didn't know the protocol of um going before the father was and the 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 temple is a foreshadowing of what of messiah right it's a foreshadowing of of messiah coming the the veil being torn and us being able to enter into the presence of yahweh by his blood um not by you know the blood of um of the bulls and the rams and you know offerings and all of this stuff so where a new believer, you know, the, the scripture says, too, that um, I believe it's in uh, Hebrews 10. I was reading it. Um, hold on. It, it, well, if it's OK, I'm going to read. Uh, I, I'd, I'd like to read that um, because I think it's really kind of ties everything that we have talked about today, discussed today. Um, but it, the, the law is written uh, on our hearts. And so when we go before the Father, it's almost as if as 
not even a believer yet as we are becoming a new believer and we fall on our knees and we go before the Father with these offerings and these sacrifices and the offering and sacrifices are humility and um, and the, the asking for the forgiveness of sin and the repentance. And, um, and so it's no longer about like what what you were saying, Joe, the you know the na- I was writing this as you were talking about the the natural and the spiritual, where a new believer comes with an offering or sacrifice in the spiritual. It's not in the natural where we see here and in, in um, with the you know with the law with the with the bulls and the rams and the offerings and the sacrifices, and um, that it's it's they come in the a new believer comes in the spiritual. Um, and it's no longer about the natural, the physical, the offerings, the sacrifices, but the spiritual condition of the heart in which we approach the Father through Yeshua. That we're realizing that we're dirty. They went through a process of they were told, this is how you clean yourself. And now we're in a place where the law is written on our heart. The, I mean, people come to Messiah all the time without even having opened up a Bible. And they, they realize that they're dirty. And the only way that they know to get clean is to come before Messiah. And um, so realizing that we're dirty and it is only by his blood that, that we can be cleansed. Um, and if it's okay, I'd like to read um, Hebrews 10. This isn't a very good translation. It's the NLT. Just, you know, forewarning you. Um, so the old system in the law of Moses was only a shadow of the things to come, not the reality of the good things Christ has done for us. The sacrifices under the old system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once and for all, and their feeling of guilt would have disappeared. But just the opposite happened. Those yearly sacrifices reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That is why Christ, when he came into the world, said, You did not want animal sacrifices and grain offerings, but you have given me a body so that I may obey you. No, you were not pleased with animals burned on the altar or with other offerings or sin. Then I said, Look, I have come to do your will, O God, just as it is written about me in the scriptures. Christ said, You do not want animal sacrifices or grain offerings or animals burned on the altar or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they are required by the law of Moses. Then he added, Look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to establish the second. And what God wants is for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands before the altar day after day, offering sacrifices that can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as one sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down on the place of highest honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled as a footstool under his feet. For by the one offering he perfected forever all those whom he is making holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, This is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts so they will understand them. And I will write them on their minds so they will obey them. Then he adds, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. Now when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. This is the new life-giving way that Christ has opened up for us through the sacred curtain by means of his death. And there's uh, the NASB version actually says that the, it says, uses the term veil come for us through the veil by means for his death. And it, it, it um, states that it's his flesh. That the, that the veil is his flesh, and it is by his flesh that we walk through in order to go to the holy place. So I'll, I'll stop there, but if you get a chance, guys, read it because the, the rest of the chapter, because this really um, spoke to me and just really summed up everything that, that we've you know, talked about today as far as sacrifices and, and who Yeshua is in that sacrifice. Yeah. 
the uh that's that was real good but the one thing that was that that was reading i think when you was reading the commentary was that uh it said that the old sacrificial system was never able to take away sin that's not correct I, I, it's bad translation <laughs> that displayed I, I yeah. before i started reading <laughs> god didn't give them a uh, a faulty system I yeah, it wasn't a it wasn't a permanent system. It was a temporary thing, but it uh, but but God gave them a a, a way to atone for sin. Um, there was something else I want to say, but it's not coming to mind right now. So I'll go ahead and wait. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, so I was surprised when we started reading the half Torah that it didn't start at the beginning of the chapter. I was like, what? You know, because the beginning of the chapter talks about the presence of the Shekinah glory coming back to earth. Then he led me to a gate, the gate that faced east, and there coming from the east, with a roar like the roar of mighty waters was the presence of the God of Israel. And the earth was lit up by his presence. The vision was like the vision I had seen when I came to destroy the city, the very same vision that I had seen by the Kibar Canal. Forthwith, I fell on my face. The presence of Yehovah entered the temple by the gate that faced eastward. A spirit carried me into the inner court. And lo, the presence of Yehovah filled the temple. And I heard speech addressed to me from the temple, through, though the man was standing beside me. It said to me, O oh mortal, this is the place of my throne and the place for the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the people of Israel forever. The house of Israel and their kings must not again defile my holy name by their apostasy and by the corpses of their kings at their death when they place their threshold next to my threshold and their doorpost next to my doorpost with only a wall between me and them. They would defile my holy name by the abominations that they committed and I consume them in my anger. Therefore, let them put their apostasy in the corpses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell among them forever. Now you, O mortal, describe the temple to the house of Israel and let them measure its design. And that's where we started, wasn't it? Okay, but it's like, but let them be ashamed of their iniquities. And when they are ashamed of all they've done, make known to them the plan of the temple. Uh, skip number 12. Such are the instructions for the temple on top of the mountain. The entire area of its enclosure shall be most holy. So that is still yet to come. <laughs> and it just seems like even though we're talking about the spiritual and the holy of holy, I mean, we're talking about the new Jerusalem. Somehow we don't, we've got to remember there's, that's going to happen. This is God coming to dwell on earth again as far as his presence. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I kind of wanted to just real quickly, briefly touch on what you said about um, the sins. I did look up the, the scriptures, the 2009 version. It does say the same thing that it was not able to take away, which can never or can't take away the sins in the CJB. In CJB? <laughs> Uh, CJB also says the same thing, which can never take away sins. And I believe that the underlining tone there being a permanent taking away of the sins. So, yes, it, it is basically was a covering at the time, but it wasn't a permanent solution to uh, our sins. So I just want to kind of. It was for one year. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 30 days money back guarantee. <laughs> Uh, as uh, Joy was actually uh, describing the throne, and uh, that reminded me that uh, somebody I was talking somebody, I think it was Ryan uh, last week, and we were talking, you know, why are we 
studying the tabernacle uh, and you know all the details and everything like what's uh, you know why is it uh, that important and uh, and uh, they just uh, it reminded me that I, I forget to mention it uh, during the the study last week that it's really the tabernacle is pointing to the uh, to the setup to the heavenly court in heaven where the father is and then you have the whole in revelation chapter 4 and 5 it describes the setup it has the 24 elders around the father uh, right and then before uh, then after that there is the seven spirits like the me menorah uh, and then you have the four living beings and then you have a yeshua the messiah uh, and then you have the father so really uh, the tabernacle uh, describes the uh, really the most important place in the entire universe uh, uh, in in heaven and on earth and uh, so studying about tabernacle is actually a, like studying the heavenly court in in, in heavens and uh, and you wanna who doesn't want to know about the most important place in universe so that's why it's important I'll be quick. I remember what it was. I was in, earlier when we was talking. We was talking about the veil, and uh, the veil was there to to shield the glory of God, uh, because the glory of God was just too much for people to, to take, um, because of our sinful condition. But you know, you you know, when Moses came down off the mountain and he had the veil over his face and. He had to he had to hide his face because his face shone, uh, and then you talk about Yeshua being the the veil, you know that uh, that through his flesh, uh, and and so through the flesh of Yeshua we can see the glory of God. Now I want to make a comment when Dean was talking about when the when the veil of the temple was rent. Everybody, uh, lots of people say that means that we now have access to the holy of holy, but think about this: when the veil of the temple was rent. And I asked Dean when I was sitting there, but uh, what what did they what was inside? Nothing. There was a floor with some blood on it. Everything else was gone. They had been going through the motions for years and years and years. Yeah, and it it it, it go, the God had already exited the temple. That, so, you know, that's not that that symbolism don't don't track. <laughs> One thing that just came to mind too, you gotta you gotta uh, remember also. Aaron had bells on his uh, yeah. uh, base of his garment, so if he didn't make it out, they knew the, if the bells quit ringing, they had to drag him out. Somebody drag him back. It's so. It's so strapped. We need that slip and slide we talked about earlier with. The oh <laughs> my word! <laughs> the See you, Ryan. Of all y'all, let's say it right. Of all y'all. All you people. Of all y'all. Okay. Anything else before we move to the Brit? All right, there's a couple of uh, passages depending on timing. The first one is Hebrews 13. Oh, sorry, Kyle. Yeah. Fire away, dude. Um, <clears throat> okay. Addressing, addressing what was said earlier, Miss um, Danielle. Um, don't call her miss. Please don't call me miss. I love you. It's grandma. And it's not <laughs> grandma either. It's Nani. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, so, so you were addressing, uh, you were addressing Hebrews 10, um, 
and uh, and and also I know I know um, but also also uh, Romans 2 um, also Roman Romans 2 basically 10 through let's just say 15 or 16 um, references the Torah written um, on our hearts um, both both of these scriptures are in reference to an event that is to, is to come that has not happened yet so we need to be careful in um, in our understanding of the difference between having conviction of the holy spirit and the torah being written on our hearts um this gives this gives reference to um let's say in hebrews this covenant uh it Hebrews 10, 16, this is the covenant that I shall make with them after those days, says Yahweh, giving my laws into their hearts and in their minds, I shall write them and their sins and their lawlessness, I shall remember no more. Um, and I, I don't know if it's further down in this particular scripture or if it's in, in, the, in Romans or what. Uh, in Romans in 16, uh, Romans, uh, da, 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 da. Romans 15, or let's just read 14 and 15 for, for when nations who do not have the Torah by nature, do what is in the Torah. Uh, although not having the Torah, they are to a Torah unto themselves who show the work of the Torah written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or even ex, uh, excusing. Um, in the day when Elo Elohim shall judge the secrets of men. So all of these are referencing uh, future, future events. Uh, there's another scripture, I believe, that references, you will not have to tell your brother to know Yahweh because he will. Um, Jeremiah 31, 31. There you go. Um, so, so we need to recognize the difference, especially when, when speaking to our Christian brothers who have this, this idea that the, the, the law or Torah is already written on our hearts. If that were the case, then we would fulfill what is in our hearts. We would be walking in Torah, and that means all of it. That's just not an event that's happened. So we need to be careful not to confuse Torah being written on our hearts and conviction of the Holy Spirit, two, two different things. That's all. Could I jump in there? Uh, good, good word, Kyle, because um, I, you see that all the time. Everybody, we're a new covenant church. We're new covenant this. We're new covenant that. And to, to get the understanding of it is we have been, Jesus said, this is the, the, the blood of the new, this is the, uh, the the new covenant in my blood when he died he said he's initiating the new covenant in his blood so the new covenant has been initiated but it hasn't been fulfilled and if you go to jeremiah 31 31 you'll see what kyle was trying to say he says and in that day you won't be teaching each other because all will know me and that uh you know it says I, this is the covenant that i'll make with the house of israel and with the house of judah and if you read, you read that section of Jeremiah 31, uh, 31 through 35, you'll see that it's an event yet to come. But we've been given a down payment. We've been given the Holy Spirit, which is a down payment on the new covenant. So we have a taste of what's to come. But what Kyle's talking about is an event that's yet to come when we won't sin anymore against God because he has written it in our hearts. He has cleaned us. He has washed us. He's cleansed us, and he's written a word in our hearts, and we'll forever be with him, and we won't sin against him. And the thing we have to remember when we're reading these things in English is, first, what language they were originally in and second, what original language they're referencing. So when we look at that, um, some of this uh, uh, information in Hebrews state chapter, for example, speaking of a new covenant, that is a direct quote from Jeremiah 31 that um, uh, Mitch was talking about. To look solely at the definition of the Greek word used for new in this passage, kainos, would leave the impression that this covenant is made from scratch, brand new, as it were. However, when we look at the Hebrew word for new in Jeremiah, kadash, 
from which the Greek is referencing, we find its definition to mean renew, repair, to make fresh. Fair enough. The problem with that is you go to Galatians chapter 3, and it'll tell you that any time a covenant has been confirmed with blood, that nothing can ever be added to it or nothing can ever be taken away from it. It's just like a, a, a will and testament. Once you write a will, you can't add anything else to it. It's done. If you want to make a new will, you can take that same will and change one little line in it, and then you have a new will. So, yeah, it's almost the exact same will that you had before, but it's a new will because the other one is no longer valid. You see what I mean? There's plenty more there, so we can have those discussions sometime. <laughs> All right. Um, so the half tour or the um, Brit uh, section is Hebrews 13, verses 10 through 17. Where did you get that one out of? Um, a couple of different places. The Hebrew for Christians, the uh, um, well, I'm, I'm calendar the that source one that has uh, Matthew five. Matthew five. Uh, Philippians four is another one. Oh, okay. So, yeah. That's Hebrews one. Hebrews. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've tore a Hebrews thirteen. What now? Hebrews Ten through seventeen. Okay. I tore a resource. I just pulled up. Um, what tour resource am I looking for? <laughs> oh, well. Can I read? Can I do thir Hebrew 13? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. All right. And we can read the others, too. Yeah. We got time. We got time. Let's read the whole Bible. Do it. Jesus, baby. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hebrews 13, 10 through 16. We have a slaughter place from which those serving the tent have no authority to eat. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the set-apart place by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. And so Yeshua also suffered outside the gate to set apart the people with his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For we have no lasting city here, but we seek the one coming. Through him then, let us continually offer up a slaughter offering to praise of praise to Elohim, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And do not forget to do good and to share, for with such slaughter offerings, Elohim is well pleased. I got a question. Why would the uh, CJB not have Hebrews in it? What? I didn't see it in there. when I, I forgot I was on CJB and I didn't see it in there. Maybe it is. Uh, yeah, the CJB. Oh, calls I see. It yeah, 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 that's, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's that's because that's what it's called, Messianic Jews. Is it really? Yeah. <laughs> that's why it didn't catch my eye. Uh -huh. That's what they call Hebrews. It's Messianic Jews. I thought you were messing around at first. I was like, what's going on? It's like. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I did not know yeah. that. The complete Jewish in, in Bible. In the CJB. It's right here. It says yeah, Messianic yeah. Jews. Yeah. Yeah. That's the David Stern. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. All right, let's uh, let's look at the Matthew five passage then. Let's get with it. Come on, Kyle. Oh, Kyle, what? Kyle, what? Um, I I just like to hear y'all's input on this. So, um, this scripture, this specific set of scripture, is used a lot. Um, so. How, how is this scripture applicable if the father tells us that human sacrifice will not be accepted and that um, basically um, one cannot die on behalf of another? Like um, a father cannot, you know, take the penalty for his son and a son cannot take the penalty for his father, et cetera, et cetera. 
if those scriptures be true, what is your understanding of what this is saying? What specific verse are you referring to, Kyle? Well, this is referencing, um, uh, let's just say, this is given a correlation between um, the sin offering and and Yeshua. It says for uh, in 11, it says, For the bodies of those beasts whose blood uh, is brought unto him, into the set apart place by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. And so Yeshua also suffered outside the gate to set, to set apart the people with his own blood. Um, let us then go to him outside of the camp, bearing his reproach, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a correlation between the sin offering uh, and Yeshua. But then again, we have to take into consideration the, 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 the texts that tell us that human sacrifice will will never be accepted by the father. And, uh, and that, um, if, if, if well, death is, if, 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 if judgment or, uh, is placed on you, I can't put my life in place of yours. So with that being said, what is all right, your I, understanding? I got a little bit of said? something. I got a little bit of something, something. <laughs> All right, first of all, I just want to hear us, other people's opinions. Yeah, first of all, um, no one could sacrifice for someone else because we, we are not in a position to do that as far as we're not holy. Sacri to be a sacrifice means you have to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not holy, but I mean, it's, you have to be spotless without right. blemish. Right, you, you have to be able to do that. Now, first of all, the animals didn't have a decision in being sacrificed on the altar. Yeshua says in the scripture, gave up himself to be the sacrifice. Right. And so, but he was the perfect atonement where we couldn't be the atonement for each other. Now, it does say that uh, no greater love than this than a man's, uh, that a brother will lay down his life for another. So I look at it, was that what you're going to say? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know, right? So, but, you know, I look but at that it. that doesn't apply to sacrifice. I, I was apply. getting there. Hold on, son. <laughs> I look at that as me laying my life down for someone else. I'm not sacrificing for their sins, but that scripture saying I laid my life down. A soldier lays down his life for his country that he's, he's honoring, right? And so with Yeshua, he was, John says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was the perfect person for this. That's why, we, that's why uh, under the order of Melchizedek, it is the perfect order of priesthood because our priest doesn't have to make atonements for himself before he goes before the people to make, it, to make an atonement. So for us, we couldn't, we couldn't do that anyway because there's, not, and there's nothing pure in us to where I could die for your sins. That's, that's, you know, but Yeshua was the perfect lamb that was spotless, who was actually examined by the priest when he came into the city before the Passover report, before he was crucified, to be shown that he was blameless before them. So that, to me, is, is a whole different ballgame. And the fact that he offered up himself for the sacrifice. He wasn't like they grabbed him and murdered him. He, he allowed them to do what they did to him because at any point, he could have called down the legion of angels if he wanted to. At any point, he could have just cleaned house if he really wanted to, but he chose not to, but he chose to do the will of the Father, not, not of his own. So that's my answer to it. And isn't it interesting that, um, Joe, what you mentioned, the words of John with respect to Yeshua, they were pre-impalement. Those were prior to his execution. Yet he was still the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Does that help Kyle at all? or is that... This is for Kyle. <laughs> I just want to hear you guys' thoughts on this. I'm not, this is, th this could be a very deep, long subject, so I'm not doing any debating of any kind or, or specifically asking a question for, for, for learning. I'm, I'm just wanting to know what y'all's thought, thoughts are on this. <laughs> Can I go ahead? Oh, okay. All right. So my answer for that is um, Isaiah 53. And so this is prophecy from, from the Father through Isaiah. 
And he also, he starts it out with, because I, I mean, I know the whole Tovia Singer <laughs> thing of putting down, you know, that, no, this is not about the Messiah. But it starts out in Isaiah 53 saying, who can believe what we have heard upon whom has the arm of Yehovah been revealed? This isn't some ordinary man. This is not Israel. This is not a regular human being taking the sacrifice of sins for somebody else. This is Yehovah's, Zeroah Yehovah. It is the arm of Yehovah. And it says specifically, and when you continue on, in, in the JPS it says, for he has grown up by his favor like a tree, trunk, etc. But when you look at the Hebrew, it says, he says he's grown up kayonek as a sucking baby. Yonek is a little infant, a sucking baby. And that's how he's grown up. But he's really the arm of Yehovah. And so then you can continue to, to since that's who we're talking about, not some ordinary man. In verse 10, that says, But Yehovah chose to crush him by disease, that if he made himself an offering for guilt, he might see offspring and have long life. Then verse um, 12, For he exposed himself to death and was numbered among the sinners, whereas he bore the guilt of the many and made intercession for the sinners. So that's my answer. I don't know where it even says that no human could take, you know. It's about human sacrifice. Human yeah, human, human sacrifice. Yeah. Ezekiel 18 is one place that says that. But it, this is not talking about that. This is Yehovah's arm. And whatever that means, it actually, you know, the word Zoroa is the word arm, comes basically the same root word as Zerah, which is seed. This is Yehovah's seed. And uh, I want to, yeah, I just wanna, also want to say on top of that, the reason why he would have made been the perfect atonement for our sins is he didn't come from the seed of Adam. He was, he was the second Adam. And, and I do believe when Ron Wyatt said he found the Ark of the Covenant, and, I, and I, I, unless something's proven different, I do believe the fact that he went and got the blood tested. And when he got the blood tested, um, they said, they, you know, long story short, they asked him, uh, whose blood is this? And he explained, well, first of all, they, they were asking him some questions. He says, well, this is what it is. It has, we know that it had a mother, that it, whatever this blood mm -hmm. belonged to had an earthly mother, but we don't know, we don't know who the father was. Mm -hmm. Because there's only 20, was it 23 chromosomes, right? Right, there's only 23 from the mother's side. So we know that it would have looked like the mother's descendants. and But it didn't have, they didn't know who the father was. So the fact that the sin came through Adam and that sin kept going, there would be none of us because we're all in a fallen state. None of us would be an accepted sacrifice to begin with for the atonement of sins. But the one who didn't come from the seed of Adam was able to do just that very thing. So anyway. Yes. And that that's uh, what I was going to refer to, that he was not the son of man. He was the son of Yahweh. I know he's referred to as the son of man, but his he had a spiritual father, and that was his that was his father. He had a physical father, but the, he was not the physical father in the sense that he, um, he didn't implant the seed. Right. right. There was no seed that came from Joseph. That came from... The father. The father implanted the, the child into Mary. And by the way, the other part of that, too, when Ron Wyatt, and that's where, where they, they asked him, whose blood is this? And he said, why? He said, because they, they said to him, because the blood's still alive. When they did the test on it, they said it was still alive. And he says, that's, that's your Messiah, your Savior's blood. So anyway, that was, that was just crazy. Yeah. Uh, just throw this in uh, towards what Kyle was asking us. Um, 
before creation, before anything, it says that uh, he was the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the earth. Revelation, uh, it, no, okay, the, the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. So we see a, a picture, we can imagine a picture in, in, uh, in the spirit heavens and, and God and uh, Yeshua, you know, said, let's create this earth, let's create mankind so we can have a family, and then uh, they're going to screw up, and when they screw up, we're going to have to trash the whole thing, you know. Well, will you go down and save them, you know? Will you, will you, yeah, I'll still keep, so it's all done before the earth was ever created. You know, what happened on Calvary was a, uh, uh, was for our benefit so that we could see, you know, the, the, the expression of love that he, he did, but that was that was already taking place in the heavens. This is like a the copy, like we see with the tabernacle. Yeah, I think that, and I agree with you. It was Revelation thirteen eight because when he was slain before the foundation of earth, it's my personal opinion that when Yeshua said it is complete or finished, there's way more going on than just him meaning yeah, I just died and your sins are forgiven. I think it just it covers a lot. It was a physical manifestation of a spiritual reality. And I think up until uh, Messiah, there was always man's sacrifice, either man sacrificing animals or it, it had man in it. This is this is the father's sacrifice. He he expected uh, the Israelites to bring their best. He brought his best, and he sacrificed his best. And that's why it's not man sacrificing for man. It is actually Yahweh sacrificing for man. And I would, uh, yeah, all of that is good stuff. And Kyle, I would add to it, you know, this is a, a good question that usually comes from um, anti-missionaries or someone, uh, it hasn't been revealed to them, so then they try to logic and reason uh, through these uh, verses. Uh, but uh, ultimately, you know, you can actually pray for God's help to have the discussion even with those people. And he will guide you and uh, and and give you explanation. Uh, one of the one of the verses that I would brought up with someone who uh, who would wanted to actually discuss this w would be the when the father asked uh, Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac and bring him on Mount Moriah, the future place of the temple uh, and everything. So that's a uh, that's a one example of uh, foreshadowing of the father. And it, uh, it said that uh, that the father will provide uh, the uh, the uh, was it lamb uh, ram essentially the, he will provide the sacrifice uh, you know so and he uh, he did uh, and uh, and so it's definitely completely different concept than from what some of the other nations were doing that they were sacrificing literally their children. Uh, physical uh, ch uh, children, they were throwing them into the fire and, and things like that. Uh, it's, a, it's a completely different concept than what uh, Joe was talking about, the willing self-sacrifice. Essentially, Yeshua had a choice. He did not have to actually go through it if he didn't uh, want to. But anyway, th uh, it, it r this could be a really a, a long discussion, maybe one uh, one and one uh, more, uh, but good question. Thank you, Kyle. It says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us therefore, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For we have here no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Um, and the camp is where majority opinion rules, where there's trends and opinion leaders and personality cult and so forth where um, people are afraid to go outside the parameters of um, what's accepted within this set or that set. Um, for example, being a little bit trapped within the confines of a denominational understanding 
and afraid of really looking outside of that box um, to where revelation is. Um, but <clears throat> so when we, it's the few, it, Je- when the disciples ask Jesus, are there few who will be saved? Then he gave us that exhortation um, that, um, you know, the narrow gate and everything. So um, it's, it's when one is willing to come out from among them and to be separate and to um, live as a living sacrifice acceptably before God. It says that um, um, by him to offer always a sacrifice of praise. That's a thought on that. <laughs> okay. Good study, study folks. Thank you all. Let me, let me say one quick thing. This, this illustration's always helped me, and it'll probably help the guys, the women. I don't know if it'll help y'all at all. But uh, <laughs> when you're working on your vehicle, let's say you're working on your car, and uh, – you, you get the grease all up in your arms and everything. This is a good example to use with your non-safe friends or when you're talking to them about these things. When you when you have to, you get you get grease all over you and you go to grab a rag and you get a, a grease rag. It's already got grease all over it. And you try to wipe it off, you, you'll never get it all off. You can't get it off. you got to have a clean rag. When you get a clean rag, then you're able to remove the, the stink from your hand. And I see that, you know, as Yeshua being the clean rag. You know, no matter how much we try to wipe it off, we can't get it off. You know, you got to have that unblemished rag. So, Joe, would you close us out, please? Good tour study today, guys. Very good. Way to dig in. It's awesome. Father, we thank you for your word that goes out and never returns void. And, Father, I believe that the, uh, I am in agreement that the tour hasn't been completely written on our hearts. But I think we do good every week or do well every week that we uh, study out your word. And little bits and pieces of it, I think, kind of get stuck in there. So that every time we come around to these tour portions... There's always something to be reminded of. There's something to share with someone. There's more revelation from the Holy Spirit to reveal more from your word every time we read it. So we just give you thanks, honor, and glory for that, Father. And thank you for your son, Yeshua, our Messiah, for the sacrifice that he did make and that he was worthy. The lamb was worthy. And we read Revelation. It talks about when when they behold the lamb of God and that he was worthy to uh, to, uh, unseal all the scrolls. And, Father, something that hit me this morning or last night, I don't remember when it was, but how everything about your son, everything is interwoven is about your son. Your son's interwoven in everything, the fabric of our lives, our spirituality, our physical part, everything. That Yeshua is a part of everything that we do, and we thank you for that. Because without him, we'd all be destined for the pit of fire or the lake of fire in the end. But I thank you that he is the perfect atonement for our sins and that we can come before your throne, Father. As priests, I don't think, you know, necessarily that's another discussion for another time, but I believe the reason why we can come before your throne as priests is because he he cleanses us. He cleanses us. And without that cleansing from Yeshua, we cannot approach your throne whatsoever in that way. So Abba, thank you again always for what you've started and what you're going to complete in every one of us. Father, may we go out and may we be a blessing to others. Let the light of Yeshua shine in and through us. And Father, in all things, we give you the glory. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So for those of you who joined us online through Zoom or YouTube or Facebook, thank you for taking part in this. And um, we will see you next week.